Bible says that in their heart they might seem is worship making every strength count. We are streaming live from the Jamaica Progress of Sisters, streaming via the ministries of Facebook page and its YouTube channel. We are also streaming from the JIS's Facebook page and YouTube channel. If you are joining us today, it means that you are interested in becoming wealthy. And if you are already wealthy, it means you want to become even more wealthy. Now, you may tag the ministry at on Instagram and on Twitter at MOF Jamaica. And you can also like the ministry's Facebook page, Ministry of Finance. Now, today we have a lot in store for you, a lot of viable information, useful information that you can use to develop your financial literacy. And what do we mean by that? Financial literacy is, is just a way of understanding the financial information that is available that will help you to use financial products or even before that, become aware of financial products, use them to your advantage, and of course, ultimately, to become wealthy. Can we welcome all our viewers? We're bringing up each parish. We're starting with Hanover. Um, big up our viewers from Hanover, St. James, Trelawney, St. Anne, St. Mary, where are you? Um, Portland, St. Thomas, St. Andrew, Kingston, St. Catherine, Clarendon, Manchester, St. Elizabeth, West Milan. Good morning to all of you and welcome. And as they say in the streets from your city voice and hear the face, you know it's me, your host, Anna Smith. I am pleased to have such an impressive panel of presenters this morning. We are going to hear about what what are the new streams of income that have become available through the digital economy? That's from, I beg your pardon, that's from Kadia Francis from Digital Jamaica. We'll also hear from Michael Johnson of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, putting your money to work. Melissa Golden from Law Insurance Brokers, getting the best bang for your budget. Sheldon Christian from First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union, Bargains that make a difference. David Geddes from the Financial Services Commission, saving money for a rainy day. That was like yesterday, you know, but we can talk about it today. And Dr. Jade Lewis from Bank of Jamaica, managing your credit. That's very important. I think you'd be interested in that one because that speaks to the newly launched Credit Bureau, newly launched and has been operational for some time, the Credit Bureau system in Jamaica. Um, to tell you about Wealth Summit is the Director of Corporate Communications and Public Relations at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, Ms. Shellyan Weeks. But before she comes, allow me to give you a little context about why Wealth Summit is important. So um, I told you a term, um, financial literacy. Of course, you might guess what it means if you have not yet heard that term. It's really being literate about financial information, how you can use it. When you are literate, you are more confident. Now, financial literacy is really a part of a wider and broader plan, and that is the National Financial Inclusion Strategy. Yes, that was launched by the government through the cabinet in 2017. And the objective... And the objectives of the National Financial Inclusion Strategy is pretty simple. It's to grow the economy. But we cannot grow the econ economy if not everyone is participating. So we have to get everyone participating, hence the National Financial Inclusion Strategy. All right, so um, when it was launched in 2017, the government had a single objective of growth. And it wanted to achieve growth by expanding services to the ordinary Jamaican. So what we want to happen is that ordinary Jamaicans, and not so ordinary, have access to financial products and services that meet their needs. All right? I'll tell you a little bit, about, I'll tell you a little bit more after Ms. Shelley and Weeks, Director of Corporate Communications and Public Relations, at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, as she tells you about Wealth Summit. Good 
Good morning, everybody. Our esteemed host, Ms. Anna Smith, our brilliant panelists, who I'm very excited to hear from in a few minutes. Um, everyone joining us on Facebook and YouTube, to all the many, many civil servants in Jamaica here who is somewhere at work, whether from home or at your desk. Morning to you all. Special morning to the team over there at the Ministry of Finance. And good morning to everyone who's joining us by whatever means. What comes to your mind when you hear the word wealth? Well, for a lot of persons, they think of a scene from some gangster movie with somebody swimming on the bed with a lot of cash, or a nice big boat, or even, I don't know, some really, really fast cars. Webster's Dictionary defines wealth as an abundance of material possessions, supplies, material objects that have economic utility. The truth is, Wealth means different things to different people. And if we were to go by the movie example, wealth looks like a massive, massive house, lots of beautiful cars, and for some reason, skinny blondes. I don't know what that part is about. For me, wealth represents freedom and choice. So my version of wealthy is the ability to travel wherever I want, whenever I want. Welcome to Wealth. Summit. Now, I've been asked on fev several different occasions, why? Why Wealth Summit? Why now? Why even the name Wealth Summit? Shelly, people are trying to survive now. Nobody not thinking about wealth. And I'm like, really? Why not wealth? Why not now? Let's face it. We are still in the throes of a global pandemic. And all of our pockets have felt it. I know mine have, and I don't know what your financial situation is, but I can guarantee you that this pandemic has definitely challenged it. It is important for us to recognize that many of us are struggling, even today, just to make ends meet. And that is why Wealth Summit is so relevant right now. Some of the things that we must examine is that we were taught some things about money that truthfully are no longer relevant. For example, financial advisors and bankers have always been telling me that I should have a three to six month emergency fund. Mm. COVID has certainly taught us that our emergency funds need to last much longer. So when we think about wealth, we must be willing to unlearn some of the things and rethink some other concepts so that we can empower ourselves as we navigate through this very, very challenging period that we're facing. We have to be more deliberate about how we manage our money. Personally, I know I need some help keeping track of my money. I mean, I know it's not just me. Have you ever spent, I don't know, $1,000? Like you start off the morning and you spend $1,000 and you buy something and at the end of the day you have $200 and then you're sitting there wondering, but what did I buy? Where the rest of the money gone? Well, all of these little things hung add up. I mean, how many $1,000 bills have you spent like that and cannot remember what you did with the money? This summit is created to help us better manage our money. And it's a great way to help us increase our wealth, help us to attain wealth. And we want to start right now. So if you're tuning in right now, and I don't know, you have a nine to five job, maybe you have a small business, you have an idea to start a business, maybe you just left school and trying to find a job, or maybe you're just broke and trying to find a way out, trying to find a way to make some money and get out of debt. There is something here for you today. So grab your notebook, grab your recording device, link your friend, tell them to join you, because this experience will be very useful to you and your friends. Make sure you know the tips. Take advantage of the advice. Use the tools that are recommended. And ask your questions. Because we want to not just help you make better, better use of the money that you have. We're going to show you how you can find some new money. The fact is, wealth is attainable. Yes? even to you. And if you're willing to put in the work, if you're willing to exercise some discipline, 
And if you're willing to take advantage of opportunity when they come to you, you can certainly be one of the wealthy ones. History has shown us that after a great hardship, there's usually a period of great prosperity. I know a lot of us will agree that we are facing a period of some hardship just now. So let's get ready for the prosperity now. Jamaicans are resilient, we're creative, and we are very familiar with hard work. I mean, who works harder than Jamaicans? Wealth Summit is here to give you the tools so you can tap into that fighting spirit and take that first important step towards your financial security. This is a team effort, so I want to just say a big thank you to all the brilliant presenters that are here today who are giving up their time and their, and their expertise. And this event simply wouldn't have happened without their input. I look forward to learning from all of you. To our host, Ms. Anna Smith, thank you for taking the challenge and for guiding the proceedings here today. I especially want to thank the team at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service and my personal crack team at, in the CompR department, the CompR branch. I want to say a big thank you to you. It's a lot of running around, but you have put it together, and here we are today. I especially want to thank you, all of you, everybody who's tuning in, whatever device you're using, whatever app you're tuning in from, thank you. This is for you. Welcome to Wealth Summit. I hope you learn. I hope you get your questions answered. I hope you will be better equipped to make use of the money that you have now and the money that you will make at the end of all of this. Thank you. Hi, Miss Anna. <laughs> Shelly? I'm sure we enjoyed those opening remarks by Shelley and Weeks, Director of Communications and Public Relations at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. She's sitting with me for just a few minutes to answer a couple of questions. Shelley, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Thank you for being here. All right, yeah. as I, de as I de develop my financial literacy. Yes. <laughs> All right, the first question I want to ask you, Shelley, because this, this question um, will be repeated throughout the throughout today's summit. Yes. Why is financial literacy important, especially from the perspective of the Ministry of Finance? Well, it, it was important for us to recognize that financial literacy, as simple as it sounds, it is something that a lot of Jamaicans are able to benefit from. And part of that has to do with a lot of the different concepts in finance and, and even understanding seems to be limited in terms of where you can get access and how you can learn about them. Mm -hmm. And for some persons, understanding simple things like how to create a budget, for example, mm -hmm. is not something that we are taught to do. So we sort of figure it out and, you know, we have the money and then we know that we have to pay bills, but we don't actually plan for our money. Mm -hmm. So this concept is not very, um, as, as simple as it is, it's not something that most of us practice. And the whole idea behind putting something like this together is to put us in the mind where we can see if we are more deliberate and if we plan for our money, then our money will be beneficial to us and we can, can work definitely for us. reap the benefits from spending it in a, you know, 
plan do it. All right. So, so tell me something, Shelley. Yes. Well, Summit, is it a one-off event or can we look forward to more? Actually, no, it is not a one-off event. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be happening three times this year, one every quarter. Well, two quarters gone already. Yes. So for the other two quarters. And this is a vehicle to, as you say, to improve the knowledge bank where finance is concerned mm -hmm. for Jamaicans. And we really want people to understand that this is designed for everybody to understand. This mm -hmm. is not just for the bankers and for people who do finance as a business every day. Mm -hmm. If you are a mother and you need to figure out how you're going to make your pay by, by, by school books and supplies and all of that for your kids going back to school, there is something here for you today so everybody can benefit. All right. Thank you, Shelley. I'm sure our viewers... Uh, are very happy to note that Wealth Summit is not a one-off event. They can yes. look forward to more, and we look oh, forward to hearing what the um, what the other summits will discuss. Absolutely, <laughs> and trust me, this one, if this is anything to go by, <laughs> you're in for a treat. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Shelley and Weeks, Director of Communications and Public Relations at the Ministry of Finance. Now, we're going to go to our first presenter, but before we take our first presenter... I'd like to share with you a couple of things, all right? So we're going to be together for, for a while today. So the, the summit is from 10 to 2 p.m. And throughout that period, uh, I'd like you to learn from the presenters. Of course, learn from me. All right, so the first thing is that there is a word of the day. I'm going to teach you a word. And that word is PESIB, P-E-S-S-I-B. -S I'm going to tell you what the word means, letter by letter. All right, if you're just joining us, you're inside the Ministry of Finance and Public Services inaugural Wealth Summit, Investing in Jamaicans. And this month's theme is making every cent count. All right, so um, before we bring on, bring on our first speaker, presenter, um, let me tell you about financial inclusion. All right, we, we did say that um, that this summit is supported by the National Financial Inclusion Strategy that was launched in 2017. And it really demonstrates the government's commitment to creating an enabling environment that makes it easier for Jamaicans to save, invest, and do business. We also, the government also wants Jamaicans to have access to financial products and services that they need and that will help them of course, to create wealth. So the National Financial Inclusion Strategy, of course, was approved by the cabinet, but it is operationalized by the Bank of Jamaica, which is home to the National Financial Inclusion Technical Secretariat. Now, there are some highlights of financial inclusion. All right, so this is where I want you to get your, your iPad and your upper pencil. If you don't have an iPad, take out your notepad. And your HB pencil. You remember the one, that the yellow one with the, with, the, with the red tip? Yeah. Take them out and you're going to take notes. All right. So the objectives of financial inclusion, which is part of why you're here today, is uh, to ensure that every Jamaican has a no-frills bank account. So this is, it makes it easier to, to receive and send payments. All right. We also, one of, another objective is to have as many savings products that help you to develop your wealth. And there is also the objective of simple and affordable loan products. No frills, no gimmicks, all right? Simple products that the ordinary Jamaican can have access to. And then we also want a wider variety of remittance and money transfer facilities. And last but not least, we want micro and non-micro insurance products um, and pension plans, right? All of these are highlights of financial inclusion, and all of these will be discussed throughout today's summit. Now, I am very excited to introduce our first presenter, Kadia Francis, from Digital Jamaica. She'll be presenting on finding new money. Now, channeling her passion for digital, Kadia Francis launched the Digital Jamaica blog in 2018. Three years on, and Digital Jamaica has blossomed into a full-fledged information exchange blog um, featuring knowledge sharing, podcasts, live shows, bi-monthly webinars, which are all focused on the growth and development of technology in Jamaica and, te and technical professionals. 
Um, she put her money where her mouth is. In 2020, she quit her job to launch the digital disruption agency business with her partner, Monique McIntosh. Kadia's mission is to future-proof Jamaicans through digital literacy, skills training, and the facilitation of access to crucial digital type information. Ladies and gentlemen, none other to speak to you about a digital Jamaica is our next guest, Kadia Francis. Good morning, Kadia. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Wealth Summit. Are we so excited? Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're excited to have your presentation today. Uh, you can tell me right away what will be the highlight. Well, I'm actually, as you said, talking about finding new money. Yes. But I'm going to come at it from a different angle because my whole lane, which I stick to <laughs> all the time, is yes. digital. digital. So I'm going to share with you how uh, Jamaicans yes. have been able to uh, get online and earn money from okay. their skills or their talent. Yes. Um, in the digital space. But first, I'm going to give you a little background about what facilitates that, which All is right. Web 2.0. Ah, so I'm going to give you a breakdown of what Web 2.0 is, yes. and then I'm just going to go straight into what is the creator economy, because yes. that's pretty much what we're talking about, yes. uh, what's involved in that, and how we can monetize our skills and talents to find new money, All right. right? By creating our own opportunities online. All right, ladies and so gentlemen. So that's what we're going to be talking it about. It promises to be quite an informative presentation. Right. The presentation on the digital Jamaica Web 2.0. Remember, you know, iPad, Apple Pencil, <laughs> Notepad, <laughs> HB Pencil, anything in tech, please take notes. T-E-C-H, notes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Kadia Francis. All right. Do I come? Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Kater Francis from Digital Jamaica. Digital Jamaica is an information and knowledge sharing platform around anything tech and digital. What we do is we promote, we inform, and we educate. Now, as Anna said, Digital Jamaica was started in 2018 out of a passion of mine to... Uh, spread information because as we all know information tends to be at a premium in Jamaica and I wanted people to be very aware of this well new thing to us which was the digital space and the opportunities that we could find and create for ourselves in the digital space so in 2018 where's the present in 2018 I quit my job not in 2018 2020 April 2020 last year I quit my job and decided that I was going to go full-time into digital. Now, as we all know, this was the beginning of what would be a year-long, and we're still there, a global pandemic. But something told me that this would be a good time to do what I've always wanted to do, which was to spend my time educating Jamaicans on digital. 
so that's what I did. And as it turns out, I was onto something because a year on, Digital Jamaica is growing and I've actually launched another brand called the Digital Disruption Agency with my business partner, Monique McIntosh. And so far, we have trained over 3,000 persons in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. We have developed courses and delivered courses for everyone from the Jamaica Observer to the Heart Trust. So clearly, <laughs> there was a catalyst. The, the pandemic was a catalyst for many Jamaicans to actually explore new ways of being able to either preserve their businesses or to uh, create new streams of income for themselves. But this was all made possible because of something that we call Web 2.0. So what is Web 2.0? It's not a new version of the web, but what it is, is, is an evolution in how we use the web, right? So we go from passive consumption of content on the internet, which was like static website pages where you would go to view information, but there was no interaction between you, the consumer of that information, and the creator of that information. So Web 2.0 has allowed what I call uh, a direct communication between the creator and the consumer of the information. So it's more active participation but not just that you're also able to create and share um, on web 2.0 as well so what are some of the tools web 2.0 tools that facilitates this kind of interactivity well you are very familiar with some of them we're talking about social networks Facebook Instagram TikTok. We're also talking about search engines. So YouTube and Pinterest, yes, YouTube is a search engine, is actually not a social media network, right? We're also talking about podcasts. So we also have a podcast, the Digital Jamaica Podcast, where we talk to Jamaicans who have been successful in the digital and tech spaces just to find out how they did it, who they talked to, where they went, right? Blogs and wikis, you guys are, should be very familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is actually a knowledge exchange platform where anyone can go on and put the information there, edit the information, add to the information, all of that. So all of these are what we call Web 2.0 tools because they allow us to interact with content creators. They allow us to participate in the sharing and the consumption of the content. And it also helps us to create the content, right? So what, where, does, where does the money part come in? Because I'm sure that's what everybody wants to know, right? So the economic aspect of all of this comes in because of what we call the new business model. And the new business model allows creators to earn money from their digital brand. In other words, as I like to call it, value profiting. So you're profiting from your talents and your skills and the value that that creates for, again, the consumers of that kind of content. So in a nutshell, this is, this is what we call the creator economy and it is all powered by Web 2.0 and the opportunities that we now have to share, to create, and to earn in that space. But who, who is a creator? If you guys are seeing the screen, I'm sure you all recognize this person. His name is Rohan Perry. We all know him as Quiet Perry, right? So some time ago, Quiet Perry got on the internet and he created this character called Patricia, right? And he would do uh, short skits or what we call comedy sketches. And through that, he was able to build a following on div di these different digital platforms. And out of that, out of the creation of that kind of content, a lot of opportunities has opened up for Quiet Perry. In fact, he has been able to make the transition off of digital into traditional media spaces and earn from both ends, right? But who is a creator? So clearly Rohan is a creator, but who else is a creator? Do you have to be a comedian? Do you have to be an artist? No. Anybody who creates content for uh, digital spaces, who creates and publishes content on the digital space with an intention to earn from it, to profit from it, is called a creator. So if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, student, anybody with any kind of skill, 
or talent that can be shared in the digital space and who can earn from that skill and talent, we call you collectively creators, right? Okay, so what powers the creator economy and creators? Well, it's the community. It's the power of the community. Uh, you can't be an influencer or a successful creator without the backing of a uh, community that you have developed. So in truth and in fact, and for the most part, creators earn by leveraging their audience and platform for profit. So I go online, I build my personal brand around whatever talent or skill that I have. I attract persons to my platform with content, right? I develop a community that is interactive and active. And I then use my community in some way. And I'm going to talk about that when we go further to talk about monetization. I then use my community and my platform, the how many um, thousands of followers that I have, and I, and I can go to an advertiser or I can go to a brand and say, look at all the people that I have. I have this audience. You want access to my audience, and you're going to have to pay for that access. So in truth and in fact, what you're leveraging is your audience and your platform. So let's look at Rohan Perry. In total, across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, he has a combined audience of almost 1.4 million people. That's a lot of leverage, right? 1.4 million people can earn you a decent enough living where you don't have to do a 95, right? So let's talk about how this is possible. And we're going to talk about monetization because that's what we call it when a creator turns their content into profit. We call it monetization. These are the avenues or the strategies that you can use to earn. So there are two types of monetization, direct and indirect monetization. Direct monetization is really where you are, uh, you create the brand and directly from the brand, you're creating something around the brand that you're selling directly. And I'm talking about a product. That's the first one. You guys may recognize this person. Her name is uh, Christina Gonzalez, and she is a fitness instructor. And she, since the COVID, she has been on Instagram, and she has done collaborations with everybody from Grace to all sorts of different people. I think she did something with Jamaica Moves as well. And she is a bodybuilder, a fitness instructor, and she has created 876 tutorials. And what she's done is that you can pay her to join her Zoom fitness class, and you can dance your way to sexiness, right? That's pretty much what she does. So she has created a product around her brand as a fitness uh, instructor, somebody who's knowledgeable in that space. Another um, means of direct monetization is through sponsorship. Kalila Reynolds, everybody knows Kalila Reynolds. She is an award-winning journalist who has now turned her journalism prowess into $26 million worth of profit in the last year alone through her company, Kalila Re um, Media, which is a digital media company. And what Kalila has done is created several different products, including taking stock, and people actually pay her, sponsor uh, ads in, on her show, or sponsor her show, which is mostly broadcast over YouTube. So she has created a product, and persons are, are sponsoring that product because it's a quality product that people want. People are engaged in that. And she also has a very active uh, community online. The other uh, way you can um, earn directly is through what we call brand partnerships. So this gentleman here is Yannick Wright. Yannick Wright is a, what, what I call a super gamer. He's a Jamaican. He lives right here. And he plays games for a living. He has a Twitch account. He has a YouTube account with over 2 million followers together. He has 1 point something million followers on YouTube. And what he does is he literally sits there and plays games and talk about games. And he has brand partnerships with about four different gaming companies, people who make um, apps for games, people who are involved in that gaming industry. And outside of ad revenues that he makes from YouTube, he also makes money through brand partnerships. The other way you can make money uh, 
directly, this gentleman here is called Wellesley Gale. Wellesley Gale is the creator of MyIslandJamaica.com. It is, believe it or not, one of the uh, most popular Jamaican websites, even more than some GOJ pages, <laughs> because he's really good with what we call SEO, search engine optimization. And what Wellesley has done is he has turned his brand into products that he sells. So well as it kind of captures all of this, he has brand partnerships, he has products, he has sponsors, but what he also has is what we call uh, donations, right? So what he has done is he has set up a Patreon account where persons who are interested in the type of content that he's creating pretty much pays him to create that kind of content every month. Right? So donations is another way. And this is donation that comes directly from your community. Your community will pay you for the type of content that they want to see. Create an economy, right? So these are just some of the ways that you can directly profit from your brand once you've been able to establish a brand online. But there are some indirect ways that you can also uh, benefit there are some indirect ways that you can also uh, benefit as well. And this is through merchandise, or what we call merch. This gentleman here is Chevon. Chevon is the creator of Proud Jamaicans. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how many of you know that um, platform. Proud Jamaicans combined, he has over a million followers across the different platforms as well. But what he has been able to do really, 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 really well is sell merchandise. So if you should go on his Teespring store, he has a massive Teespring store. He has everything from doormats to tights to tops, just about everything, and it's all emblazoned with Jamaica, Jamaica something, right? Um, and it's very popular because he is catering to a diaspora audience, and a diaspora audience that is very, that will fall for what we call nostalgia. He, he does what we call nostalgia marketing. So a lot of what he produces on his channel is talking about the good old days and being Jamaican and missing Jamaica. So he's bringing in persons who are living overseas but have a yearning for home. And through his platform, they're able to connect back with their roots, right? And it has been very profitable uh, for for Chevron in that regard. You guys might know this lady, Shelly Ann Weeks. <laughs> Had to include her in the presentation, why not? Uh, another way you can uh, profit from your um, brand online through the creator economy is through events. So Shelly Ann Weeks is very popular in the digital space as Dr. Sexy Ann. And through her brand, um, she, where she talks about period poverty, she also has events that she produces. So period parties and a, 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 an annual pelvic conference, healthy pelvic conference that she does. And these are ways that she can make passive income from her brand as well. Right? Another popular um, person on the digital space is Rushcam. And Rushcam is an attorney. That's his background. His background is law, right? But he decided to put that aside, and he's now what we call a social commentator. So he will be on, he has his own YouTube channel, and he comes and he shares his ideas and his thoughts about different things, and he regularly collaborates with other creators, including Quiet Perry. But now he has been able to transcend the digital space into traditional media, and he's now the host of a popular um, TV series featuring other creators, right? Now they're all making money. Uh, together um, in the traditional media space. So hosting and speaking engagements is another way that you can earn. And lastly, you can earn through ad revenues. And this lady here is Rochelin. That's her name online. She's a YouTuber who makes money through ad revenues from YouTube. She, and this is the thing. There are some very familiar faces and popular faces in this group. So Kalila and Rushcam and Shellyan. But I'm sure the other persons you may not have been familiar with, right? Rushelin doesn't have a huge platform. She has, what, 40K, almost 50K persons on YouTube. But she has still been able to make a living. So what I want to disabuse you of is the idea that you have to have a massive following online to be able to earn from your skill or from your talent. There's another lady that's not on here. Her name is Patricia Reedwa. 
Auntie Pat would like to call her. She's 70 plus years old. I'm not going to give you her age, right? She's 70 plus years old. She has, she has lived a lifetime. She has done so many things in her lifetime. Traveled. She has been a justice of the peace. She has done so many important things. But now she's moving into the next phase of her life, what she calls her second career, and that's digital. Auntie Pat, by just going online and talking and exercising her expertise, she has now been able to cop brand deals in terms of writing children's books, writing poems. Uh, Auntie Pat has been able to now earn a living through speaking engagements as well, and she's slowly building up her brand online. So I, I say this to you to say that anybody at any time can decide that, listen, I am a talented I have been working in the public service for 30 odd years, 40 odd years, and I've acquired this much expertise on this one particular topic. And I'm going to go online and I'm going to turn that into a course, and I'm going to sell that course to you because you definitely want to know this if this is your field, right? You're instantly now a content creator who, has, who can earn from that, from that knowledge base that you've accumulated over all this time. You are a doctor and you want to promote your new practice or you want to get patients into your new practice. MD Link has been able to create an app that anybody here with any ailment can go on to book an appointment with a doctor over WhatsApp, get your diagnosis, get your medication and go on about your business, right? So anybody in any space can decide to turn their digital skills, their talents and their skills um, into money uh, online. But there are, some, there are some benefits to this, and there are a lot of benefits to this, but there are also some limitations as well. But let's look at the, 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 the benefits before. With Web 2.0 platforms and tools, you now have easy access to the digital space. Once you have a smart device, a phone, a tablet, a laptop, and you have access to broadband internet at, at some speed, we're not going to talk about the providers who... All right. So once you have access to broadband internet and a smart device, you pretty much have access to everyone everywhere, right? And these social platforms and these search engines, and if you have uh, a solid digital strategy, you can now create something from your own efforts and put that out there and invite a community of people who either share a similar interest or who wants to learn what you know, and you can make money from that. And you also have access to what I call new markets because you no longer have to depend on a Jamaican market to sustain you. You have access to a regional and a global market. Anybody, anywhere in the world who is interested in what you have to say, what you have to share, what you have to sell, can access you through these digital um, platforms. And that's the beauty about online. You have markets to just about anywhere. It also cuts out the middleman. Uh, there's no longer a gatekeeper telling you that this is either good or it's not good. It's your community who decides the value of what it is that you're putting out there. Once you can nurture that community and you can give that community what it wants, then you're in the money. Right, So there's no middleman and it's also self-generated. It's really off your own consistent efforts in the digital space. So we have all heard of Dr. Terry Carell Reed, right? Can't talk about digital without mentioning her. Yes, she was popular before, but she has been able to make the successful transition online where she talks about one thing really well and is hosting and speaking. And through her ability to talk about these things online, she has been able to attract more clients. And now, recently, Dr. Terry Carell has been invited to give a TEDx talk right? Big deal, right? So it's self-generated based on your own consistent efforts. But these are the good things, and I can go on about all the benefits, you know, of being online. But because we live in a culture that's not a digital culture, we're very traditional, you know, doctor, lawyer, politician, probably police, you know, we're very traditional in the type of careers um, that we can choose from or that we've always chosen from, and because of that, there's a lack of digital infrastructure here. Uh, whether that is because, again, 
limited access to broadband internet in some areas, or because we were just not familiar with the digital space in general, uh, there's, a, there, there's no infrastructure there that could give us an advantage then in that way. The other limitation is literacy. We have a digital literacy problem um, as well. And several reports have come out, especially now that COVID has been a thing, and we're talking about economic recovery because of COVID. A lot of the conversation is now centering around, okay, what are the digital skills that we need to uh, give to our people to enable them to be able to compete in what is truly the digital era, right? And we have realized that we are... 40 years behind in terms of, you know, a wide digital skills gap, but most importantly, a literacy gap. The other big thing, and I know there are some bankers in here today, the other big thing is payment processing. It is all well and good for me to go online and create a book and self-publish my book, like Dr. Sexian, Shelly Ann Weeks has done. Uh, but then how do I collect payments for my creations? How do I collect payments for the content that I'm selling online? That's one of the biggest problems Jamaican creators in the digital space face. Because even though we do have some banks that do provide some payment processing um, services, it's limited. And it's the same onerous processes to access it. And there's also the cost factor that is involved that makes it cost, pro it's cost prohibitive. When there are plugins on just about every um, C CMS platform, I'm talking more like website platforms, that you can use to get payments, but it doesn't happen in Jamaica because, the, again, the infrastructure is not there. And lastly, antiquated and onerous banking processes. I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine. Uh, he runs the platform On The Road. On The Road is a popular YouTube, um, Jamaican YouTube platform that literally takes your own Jamaica and show you what's happening. And he got a check from YouTube for his ad revenues that he could not cash in Jamaica. He could not cash that check in Jamaica because the bank told him that he has to have a business account to be able to cash a YouTube check. So these are what we are talking about. We are talking about antiquated and onerous banking processes. And in, in, a, in a way, we are our own limitations in terms of what can be done in the digital space. So guys, even though these limitations are there, there are lots of workarounds that you can find in terms of processing your payments and attracting people and being able to market yourself online. So visit us um, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Digital Jamaica. You can find us on YouTube. We have a lot of conversations about these things and give you tips and stuff on our YouTube channel, Digital Jamaica. And you can visit our blog as well for more information. Okay, guys, what I want you to do is start shifting the way you think about business and about money. And when you're uh, realigning and reevaluating what is possible, I want you to think digital. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you to the ministry. Thank you to Shelly for having me here. I really appreciate it. All right. Boy, if you're just joining the Minister of Finance's inaugural Wealth Summit, 
you missed the wealthy part. <laughs> <laughs> Manalai. That was um, a presentation by Katie Francis of Digital Jamaica. But you're lucky, you know, you're lucky. She's back after the presentation. She's going to answer a few questions for us. Katie, thank mm -hmm. you so much. That was such an informative thank you. presentation. I'm going to get to hear people business. Huh? So. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, we recently uh, did a podcast episode with yes. Kalila Reynolds where yes. she literally told us how she tried to shop these ideas to traditional media spaces. Right. But there were no takers. Yes. And she just decided that, listen, I'm going to go do it myself. Aye. And $26 million later. later. <laughs> that's the <laughs> kind of story we want to hear. Yes. That yes, is yes, a yes. wealthy story. That's the power of digital. Yeah, man, that is a wealthy story. But, yeah. uh, so, Katie, uh, for, those, for those who were watching and listening, iPad, Apple Pencil, Notebook, HB Pencil, <laughs> I hope you were taking notes. I took a few notes, yeah. right? And the notes that I took summarized the ways that you can make money through digital initiatives, yeah. right? But these were on the personal level. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recount these, and then yeah. you're going to tell me how we can do it on the business level. On the business level, right? sure. So there's sponsorship. Yeah. This is on the individual, individual level where somebody can market their skill, talent, um, and time. Mm -hmm. Right, so sponsorship. And there's donations, merchandising, mm -hmm. events, mm -hmm. hosting and speaking engagements, uh, ad revenues, and brand deals. I was so, I was so impressed to, yeah. to hear about Miss Pat. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when I say I'm thinking about my mother, you talk about it. But so those are the ways that we can um we can we can leverage our personal brand our personal for for financial gain yeah. and ultimately for wealth. Yes. But for those persons who have a small business, mm -hmm. right? How can they leverage their business? How can they put it out um in the digital space more? Well, you see, this is a thing. Mm -hmm. We think of these as oh well, these are just personal brands. No, right. these are businesses. Right. Uh, the biz it, it the difference is the business is me. Mm -hmm. I am the business yes. and I'm selling myself or my services to other persons. But if you, the same applies generally to small businesses because there are a lot of Jamaicans with small businesses in the digital space. It's just about how do you use these digital platforms to become visible yes. and to become relevant uh -huh. in the online space. Right. And again, with access through your smart devices, through your internet, anybody anywhere can sell anything online. Mm -hmm. Only fans is only. <laughs> right? So anybody anywhere can put their market, even if it's a service or a physical product yes. that you're selling. So there's a lot of Jamaicans who are in the beauty space. They make soaps, they make all sorts of different things from natural Jamaican ingredient and products. Mm -hmm. They're doing very well mm -hmm. online. There's Herbu, there's F F Favor, Favor, I think that's what their name is. Mm -hmm. uh, Creek, yes. they're all Continue. doing very well mm -hmm. online, right? Even businesses who have a storefront, mm -hmm. um, or what we call a brick and mortar, right. if they are able to uh, to tap into these digital platforms, we call that omnichannel marketing. So it's not just your storefront, but it's also your digital presence. Yes. Because if you're not online, your business doesn't exist. Uh, okay. Literally, you could have a, you could have five million stores if you're not online and not in a position where consumers can find you, mm -hmm. then you don't exist. So you have to think about consumer psychology and how that has also changed yes. because of digital. If you're looking for something, where's the first place you go? Instagram. Google or Instagram, mm -hmm. right? You go to Google and you type it in, <laughs> or you go to Instagram and you search to see if there's a page or something that you can find. Right. That's why you, know, you need to be where your audience is most likely going to be. And that's why right now what's happening is that a lot of these social networking pages, Instagram and Facebook, they're literally turning into an advertising machine, yes. right? Yes. So they are now so developing tools. Traditional media. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're developing tools that allows creators and small businesses to be better able to market and advertise mm -hmm. because where the people go is where the business Where's goes the and where the marketers go. go and where are they? TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. TikTok is a new thing. Guys, <laughs> I tell you, hashtag Jamaica is yeah. one of the most active hashtags you, on TikTok. You mean hashtag Oxtail. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, and, and, and another thing too, what small businesses and even personal brands that are businesses can capitalize on is the popularity of Brand Jamaica. Yes. Brand Jamaica is exceedingly popular online. And th th what happens now is that persons now have access to Brand Jamaica. Okay. So Jamaican content, Jamaican products, all very popular online. So once you can tap into that, yes. whether it's a small business or a brand, you're in the money. 
All right, so we're we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna award a prize for <laughs> our viewers. Your viewers, you're watching, right? And you, for those of you who missed Kalia's very interesting presentation, we have a prize for you in our beer things that you wear today. <laughs> Ministry of Finance, that you wear something. Can't believe it. We work we're working our way up to the money part, though. All right, so if you can answer the question for me, which, in which year was Digital Jamaica launched, you will get a prize, a goodie bag Ooh. from the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. And you know what is in it? A piggy bank and enough other things, all right? So send your questions into the chat, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, uh, if you're watching on Twitter, I don't know if there's an Instagram feed, but send that question into the chat um, and the, the, the social media coordinator will tell me and I will announce who that winner is, all right? While you do that, let's just ask Kadia one more question. Sure. All right, so um, from your presentation, mm -hmm. me, me kind of feel a little energy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's <laughs> strong for the bank them. Because <laughs> 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 they feel the energy like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Mr. Mr. Uh -huh. Ali, Mr. Thing, they are watching now. Mr. Keith Duncan, he must have lost said, Jesus. Everywhere we go, um, we get beaten. But mm -hmm. you, you find that one of the, one of the impediments to a, more, to a more expanded digital presence in Jamaica is the banking services. Yeah. All right, so from, from my position of knowledge, I know part of that is legislation. Yeah. A lot of our laws have to change to, to bring Jamaica in line with what digital transactions um, are currently in, in other developed yeah. countries and what it will take to further include digital businesses in our economy. Yeah. But apart from the challenges, because you did say some, how to collect payments, there are literally plugins on every website you can yeah. go. But when them reach Jamaica, the, it doesn't it function plug out. here. It, it plug in out. them, plug out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't function here, but the, the good thing out. is we have platforms like WePay. Right, uh, uh, right. WePay, who has now entered the Jamaican market and who is now offering these kinds of services, WePay now have a WooCommerce plugin. Yes. But again, it still goes through the banking system. And, and that's a part of the infrastructural problem, right. right? Right, There's no legislation, there's no law. What are we talk, what, what are we going to do in terms of taxing these um, creators? Yes. What are we going to do um, if... Because a lot of the conversation, and you know, our prime minister has been very big on digital yes. and moving di and digital transformation. Yes. But that will not happen if these small systems uh, don't come are, together. Are, are not in place. So mm -hmm. we're talking a lot about e-commerce, mm -hmm. but a major part of e-commerce, in fact, e-commerce is the ability to transact. <laughs> and if you can't transact there is no e-commerce, right. right? So it's about how do we then set up a system whereby, say for instance, I buy something from you online through your Shopify account. Yes. And I have a difficult, well, not even Shopify, because Shopify pay. is very regulated still, as well as Amazon. Yeah, still we but pay. what if I buy something from you and what I get is a def defective product yes. and I want to send it back? There is actually no legislation now that is present now yes. that, that gives me an avenue for redress. Yes. That's a problem. So people, Jamaicans, is not that Jamaicans won't spend money online and use their credit card online. Amazon is the number one search platform in Jamaica. Can you so imagine? we buy from Amazon. We ship in and ship out all the time, <laughs> right? But it's because Amazon is a trusted service that yes. has processes in place yes. where I can have a redress in case anything goes wrong. Right. Without those processes here and without those processes backing these systems here, right. we're going to have a trust issue. Okay. And that, that is going to have um, repercussions all across the board. So if we're serious about digital transformation and yes. going digital and empowering our citizens to be independent, to create streams of income for themselves, mm -hmm. we have to get serious about the unpretty things, which is the infrastructure work right. and the banking and everything that is associated with that. But I'm, I'm not hard on banks. What I'm saying is we're limiting ourselves right. and we don't have to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Quite... Um, Quite an impassioned plea, if we can call it that. <laughs> you know, um, we are. They're going to free up the payment process. <laughs> we're inside the Ministry of Finance's <laughs> Wealth Summit, and I'm sure mm -hmm. the policymakers at the ministry are like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know. But um, it, it, the quite important points yeah. raised by by Kadia in terms of the need for our legislation yeah. to match our digital ambitions. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Minister of Finance, through the through your policy units, um, lobbying to the to the cabinet, to the government, just to make sure that these laws are speedily put in place, yeah. so that, as I said, our legislation can match our digital 
ambitions. Especially now, since uh, we're doing the digital currency thing and oh, we're you know rolling out digital oh, gosh. currency. Don't no talk about that yet. <laughs> 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 All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank Katie Francis from Digital Jamaica so very much for sharing her for her knowledge on digital platforms and how we can become wealthy through the digital space. All right, she touched on using your brand, personal and, and personal and business brand, for sponsorship, getting donations, for merchandising, hosting events, um, speaking engagements, ad revenues, and brand deals. All right, so that is the first way that we can become wealthy. Thank you again, Thank Kadia, you so, much. so much. All right, so um, I did pose a question to my audience. In what year was Digital Jamaica launched? Do we have a winner? Do we? All right, who is that winner? Rory Birchenson, is that so? All right, Rory Birchenson, thank you for participating. <laughs> All right, I see Rory never drawn a blank, you know, in a drawn on. <laughs> All right, so Rory, you win for yourself a goodie bag uh, from digital, uh, I beg your pardon, from the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. All right, you will be contacted directly on how to claim your prize. All right, thank you so much and congratulations, Rory. Now, our next presenter is Michael Johnson from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. All right, I have a question or two for him. All right, I can't wait to speak with him. Uh, so Michael Johnson will be speaking about putting your money to work. But before I introduce Mr. Johnson, remember that word that I taught you. PESIB, P-E-S-S-I-B. -S <laughs> All right, the first letter P, it stands for protect. All right, remember you're making notes. iPad, Apple Pencil, Notepad, and HB Pencil. P is for protect. After Mr. Johnson's presentation, I will tell you what the P stands for in the context of the broader word. Allow me now to introduce Michael Johnson. So he's been employed to the Jamaica Stock Exchange since 2007. He's the business development manager and senior marketing officer. But before that, though, he worked at the Urban Development Corporation for four years as marketing officer, where he was instrumental in developing marketing plans and strategies for all its attractions and commercial developments. He's a proud graduate of St. Andrew Technical High School, St. Catherine High School, as well as the G.C. Foster College, where incidentally, he also taught sports marketing. He holds a teacher's diploma and a, and a bachelor's degree in marketing and research from the University of Technology, my alma mater. And he has an MBA in banking and finance from the Mona School of Business. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak with us about... I'm sorry, here to speak with us about putting your money to work, I suspect through the Jamaica Stock Exchange, is Michael Johnson, Business Development Manager and Senior, op senior Marketing Officer at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Thank you, Anna, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ministry of Finance Wealth Creation Program. And thanks for having the Stock Exchange to be a part of this program. And we look forward to a very interesting morning as we go through the program. Um, first, let me say it is important to understand that putting your money to work is really important to the fact that your financial literacy should be as well in sync so that it provides an opportunity for you to understand the financial instruments that are available. And also, the literacy part comes in now where it provides you must have the knowledge to know what instrument that is out there that you can use to satisfy your financial goal. Remember, all of us have our different financial goals. And there are many instruments out there that you can use to achieve your goal. I also want to note that the stock market is one asset class that we encourage persons to have in their, in their investment portfolio. And therefore, my presentation will focus pretty much on the stock exchange and asset class of stocks. 
So putting your money to work for you. So it's not about working for money. It's about having money working for you. All right? So let's look at the performance of the Jamaica Stock Exchange over the last, let's say, five years. Um, in 2015 and 2018, Bloomberg has ranked the Jamaica Stock Exchange as the number one performing exchange in the world. And Bloomberg, for persons who are in the audience, is monitors 94 exchanges across the world. So all major markets um, have an exchange, and the Jamaica Stock Exchange in 2015 and 2018 was the number one performing stock exchange in the world. And I must add that in 2020, um, we were in the top 10. We also manage our main market and combined market value, cap market capitalization is over a trillion dollars. So let's look at some of the performances. So as we all know, 2019, 2020, and now we're still in it, 2021, the pandemic has impact all countries, all markets where that is concerned across the world. And therefore, the Jamaica Stock Exchange is no different. However, during the 20 20, the main market began with 49, 59 securities and ended the year with 63 securities. I must also point it out that the four securities that were raised over $14 billion on the market as it relates to the main market. For the junior market, it began the year and ended the year with 44 securities. However, we listed two companies on the junior market that raised over four. $425 million. Of course, for persons who are interested in, in the U.S. currency, because a lot of Jamaicans say, you know, the Jamaican market and money is, is important, but we like to diversify our currency as it relates to that. So our U.S. dollar market um, raised over 9 million U.S. dollars um, in 2020. Overall, the market itself raised over 28 Point six billion dollars. When that comp compared to 2019, there were over 34 billion dollars raised on the market. Now let's look at the five-year between 2016 to 2020 um, performance of the index. Of course, the index measures the performance of the exchange and the companies that are listed on the exchange. And you will see that the graph shows that up to 2016 and into 2019, there was a steady climb, um, growth during that period. However, in mid-2019, you, you realize that there was a decline in all the indices. For the main market, the decline was some 22.42%. For the junior market, it was 21.07%. For the select index, and I want you to make a note of a select index because I'll make some focus on that later on. The select index declined by 25.34%. And the US dollar market index declined by 17.65%. However, in 2021, we have realized that there have been some improvement in both the main market, in the junior market and the combined market. So the junior market, Remember, we talked about the decline earlier. So for 2021, we have seen some changes. And we must, I must say here that this shows some level of maturity, I must say, of the investors in the market. Many years ago, once the market starts to decline, investors will pack up and run. Um, it, is, it is encouraging to see that the financial literacy that the stock exchange encourage um, is working, that investors are not leaving the market, but what they are doing is really reposition themselves in the market. So, for instance, if they are investing in a particular stock that is not progressing as they would like, but there are other stocks in the market that is progressing, they will not exit the market, but to reposition their portfolio. And that is a mature sign of investors, and it's a, it's a welcome sign. And we at the Stock Exchange encourages that, and, and are happy to see that investors are, are staying for the long haul. So the junior market in 2021 has increased by 27.51%, and the combined index has also increased by 8.4%. Now, what are the benefits of owning stocks? There are two main benefits, right? And the additional part comes in from, you, you realize, from the benefit. 
So we talk about capital appreciation. And capital appreciation is simply the movement of a price, moving from one to two, so to speak. So it's really the growth rate of a price of a stock over a period of time. And of course, I will speak about dividend as a part of the process of benefits from stocks. That speaks to sharing in the profit as a shareholder. So let's look at it. So capital appreciation. I remember I spoke to you about the select index that declined by 25.43% earlier in 2019, 2020. Now, between 2017 to 2020, the move, this, the select index are the, more, are the 15 most traded stocks on the exchange. So these stocks are very liquid. And therefore, it shows you, it, it sometimes gives a benchmark in terms of how the, the stock market is functioning in a general way. So if you look at the opening price of these stocks, you would have realized that there are significant growth if you have purchased these stocks in 2017 and held them up until 2020 you would have realized you have made significant amount of profit or what I would call now the capital appreciation because if you, if you have not sold the stocks, you will only have considered to be a capital appreciation. You made a profit when you sell the stock at a higher price in which you purchase. So the capital appreciation here shows where the market, where the stock opens at a particular price and closes at a particular price. And over the, the five-year period here, the three-year period here, it shows the movement of some of these stocks. So I'll sh just mention a few. And remember, my suggestion or presentation is really not advising you which stock to buy, but just to give you an overall performance of the market. So I must make that clear from day one. Um, so if we look at a, a, a very popular one, which is the NCB Group, which ended the year in 2017 at $63, but closed at 20, 20, 2020 at 143 the capital appreciation is significant there, right? And it shows that investors are not hop quickly to get out of the market, but know that these companies are solid by following the information that is given about these companies. So there are a number of them. West Cinco at $9 in 2017 and ended the year at $16. So you can look at the list and you'll see the difference where that is concerned. So we talk about capital appreciation. Let's look at the other benefit. Dividend. So over the same period, these companies would have paid dividend as well. And, uh, and of course, dividend is one way in which you may benefit from owning shares. And it is the profit that the companies make, after-tax profit, that is shared between the sh for shareholders. So again, you would have realized two ways. One, the capital appreciation, and of course, the dividend payment. Right. So it's significant. And when you look at companies like Carreras, the NCB Group as well, um, Grace Kennedy, uh, Scotia Group, you see that there are significant amount of dividends that this company pays. And remember, dividend is paid per share. So as a shareholder, your dividend is calculated based on the number of shares that you own, right? And it is important that you understand that that's the two benefits. So we talk about the capital appreciation and, of course, the dividend. And, of course, now, once that is done, your dividend, you can manage that process, right? And I'll show you how you, you can do that. So, in general, because the market is, is, very, is, is open for everybody, there's no restriction. If you're under 18, you just need a parent to be there as a minor, and parents can have that. You can take charge of your portfolio once that is so. And we have a number of... Um, games and, and practice for young persons um, that practice to how to trade. And we have recognized that a lot of them have made that transition when they become adult to start to participate in the stock market for themselves because their financial literacy would have been gone from their high school time and when they go to university because the stock exchange is involved in all these areas, um, guiding youngsters to ensure that their financial literacy is up to a particular level that can allow them to also trade. We also facilitate an online trading platform that allows individuals to participate and trade for themselves. So even though you, a broker is important, and of course you need a broker account, but you are able to manage your portfolio um, by trading online as well. 
So we encourage persons, even though you, you, want, you must use a stockbroker to trade on our exchange, we encourage you to think like one, right? Find out the relevant and timely financial information. And the Jamaica Stock Exchange website provides all that information that you need on all the listed companies, all 92 companies that we have listed on the exchange. Know your portfolio. So don't... Having something happening and you, and you said to yourself, well, you know, I should be there, but you don't have that stock. Know exactly what you have. If there's a dividend being paid, if a company is offering um, benefit in terms of a stock split or, or what is happening now where some companies are offering additional share offers, you must know that, right? Know your network and know where you want it to be. Always track your investment. Too many times we have persons investing and not tracking their investment. And you don't have to sit on all day and look at it. The JSC has a mobile app. Download that mobile app. It's in the Google Play Store and it's in the, I, the uh, Apple Store. You can keep a track of your investment by simply in the palm of your hand, by using the mobile app. And therefore, it provides a convenience for you to track your, your investment. Recently, we are, for a long time, persons have been hearing about IPOs, which, is, which simple is initial public offering, which simply means that it's the first time the company is offering their shares to the public. But in recent times, we have seen a number of additional public offering, which is referred to as an APO. So as a shareholder, if you own that share already, the company is offering additional shares, it is easier for you to get into that. And a lot of times we get um, calls, persons are asking, boy, well, you know, the IPO is out today, it opens at 9.30, and by 9.31 it's closed. Don't be left behind. Remember, previous slide, think like a stockbroker. Know where the information is, try to act early. And of course, many of our brokers now have online platform that can, you can go online and you can apply for your IPO or your APO easily so know where your broker is define uh, if they have that facility and if they don't encourage them to do so but don't be left behind there's there's a lot of opportunity to put your money to work and it's important that you start early securing your dividend remember i said to you that dividend is one way in which you benefit from owning shares and it's simply just the profit shared by the share, to shareholders after tax, right? And, and all of our listed companies, all of our listed companies have what is called a dividend policy. That policy tells shareholders the percentage or the time frame and the time frame in terms of which the dividend will be paid, whether it's quarterly, half yearly, and therefore persons can be able to track their, their dividend. Importantly, however, that as a, Dividends are not guaranteed if you're an ordinary shareholder, but as a preference shareholder, the dividend is guaranteed, right? And sometimes the company, you will hear companies will say, we're having an annual general meeting to discuss certain things. As a shareholder, participate. You can do a proxy form, but participate to, so that you can know the decisions that are being made because there are sometimes the companies are making strategic decisions and they will say, okay, we have made billions of dollars in profit, but we're not going to pay any dividends today. And you must know why. And it's sometimes, in most cases, it's a long-term benefit that is, is available. So track your dividend. And we provide a facility that is called a mandate, which allows you to do so. We, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, is moving to fully digitize within the next couple of years. So printing of checks is something that we are getting out of, right? So we encourage persons to complete a mandate form. You can visit the Jamaica Stock Exchange website. It's on the screen. You can ensure that you fill out a mandate form. A mandate form is really an instruction form. There are three types of mandate. We have a bank mandate. We have what we call a whole and collect mandate, and we have a third-party mandate. The bank mandate is simply to send it to the bank. The whole and collect means exactly that. And the third party is to send it to other institutions like your credit union and so forth. So your dividend, and sometimes person will say, oh, I got a check which is, which is $100 on it or some cents for that matter. What do I do with it? 
your mandate will handle that for you. So ensure that you complete your mandate form and, and submit it. You can submit your mandate form through the JSC and through your broker, right? And as I said for earlier, is that your mandate can provide instruction to send it to a commercial bank, a credit union, or a stock broker or a billing society. Some persons will send their mandate back to their broker and use and reinvest that money when there's an opportunity comes, whether that APO or IPO. So information is very simple. So complete the form and submit it to the stock exchange. You don't have to do anything else. Once the dividend is paid, it will be, it will be remit to your according to your instruction and you will get a notification of the amount that is sent. So in terms of why invest and abandon some of the benefits that you, you, you can get from your dividend, right? Do a mandate form. Ensure that you don't do for one. If you have 10 stocks in your portfolio, with, ensure that you have a mandate for all 10, right? So don't leave any behind. Don't leave any money on the table, as they would say. Be proactive. Don't let the dividend pay that you say, oh, I, I need a mandate form and the check went somewhere, especially if you have changed your address. That is also an issue that, is, that the mandate removes. If you change your address, the mandate will take care of that. And of course, encourage your friends and relatives to do the same. Encourage your friends and relatives to do the same. Right? You can earn so much more by securing your dividend. Remember, I showed you some companies paying 8 and $10 dividend. And if you just use a basic numbers, if you have a 10,000 of the, each of the select index stocks and you have that mandate set into your bank account, you'll be surprised what you have at the end of the year. And you still have the stock getting that capital appreciation. So what the JSC plans to do beyond 2020 and 2021? We're looking to develop new products. We're looking to trade government securities in collaboration with the Bank of Jamaica. Direct market access, which allows brokers to sell stocks traded on different exchanges. Short selling. We're looking to do also do digital asset and data commercialization. Of course, we are currently upgrading our website and our mobile app to facilitate online trading on our mobile app. And of course, last but not least, diversify our products for a sustainable stock exchange. I want to thank you again for this opportunity and I hope that you all <laughs> have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. Thank you much, Michael Johnson, for your presentation. Um, please join me. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Johnson will join me for just a couple of questions. And if you have any questions in the, in the, from, the, from the live audience, please put them in the chat. Uh, and Kim will feed those questions to me. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. It is my pleasure to meet you. Nice. As well. All right. Thank you for being a part of Wealth Summit. All right. So your presentation, you gave a brief overview of the, the Jamaica Stock Exchange and the opportunities for wealth that it creates. All right. So... For the person who has no idea about how to trade stocks, what is the first thing that they should know? I would encourage them to contact the JSC. Yes. We have an e-campus right. that have programs that facilitate beginners, right. persons who are a little bit above beginners, and persons who are above the above the beginners. <laughs> so we facilitate for everyone to benefit from that as it relates to financial literacy. Because one of the things we encourage persons to do is to, to get the, the first information from source. Okay. Uh, the pandemic is going around. You, you've realized there are so many persons getting information from not this source. From not this source, yes. Right. So we encourage that you get it right the first time. Right. And therefore, we encourage persons to speak to our recruiters at the eCampus. They will facilitate. We have programs that will teach you the basic trade, ABC of trading stocks. Of trading. All right. But for those persons who... You know, them kind of, them don't want to learn it themselves, but them would like somebody to do it it's for them. Where can they go? Where should they go? All right. So the stockbroker plays a significant part there. Yeah. And, and the stockbroker is a, is a fundamental part of our, of our landscape. Mm -hmm. And therefore, persons will need a stockbroker yes. to trade on our exchange. So my suggestion would be to, as well is to contact a financial, one of the, our brokers. There are 13 of them. Um, contact one of them. 
financial advisor, I'm sure, will provide some guidance for you. Mm -hmm. And that is really where the starting point comes into play. Okay. And, and I must add, though, as mm -hmm. well, that you don't need to break the bank to open an account. There are brokers, they are willing to start with a minimum of $10,000. Ja Jamaican, Jamaican, Jamaican dollars, dollars. right? Um, and upwards as, you're, as, you, as you continue to make more money. Okay. All right. So... I, I was very pleased to hear that the stock exchange has plans to introduce new products, right? Because one, one of the questions um, that I would like to ask is, would any of those products include a more accessible way of trading, a trading app, um, things that are similar to like a Robin Hood that is, that, um, that is um, available in, the U in North America? Well, currently our online trading platform has been around for a long time. Yeah. We last time I checked, we have over probably 20 different countries around the world okay. versus trading on our online trading platform. Is, does it have a separate name from Jamaica Stock Exchange? It's our Jamaica Stock Exchange online trading online platform. Online trading platform. J Trader Pro, actually. J Trader, Trader Pro. Tra right. Trader Pro. Okay. And it is accessible. We have um, a number of our brokers participating, and, and therefore it, it is important that persons can open an account. And the beauty about but it is one, that... One second. You said brokers, but can an individual trade for it is, themselves? It is for it is facilitate because remember, okay. you would need the money to trade. Right. So where's the money you're going to trade? It has you know, to be somewhere. In a bank account. No, no it, it, <coughs> but, the, but the stock exchange yes. does not have, fac have a facility to access that funds. Right. So the, the only common place that, is, that exists between your funds and the exchange is a broker. Mm -hmm. who is licensed yes. and regulated to do so. Okay. So you will fund that account through your broker. I see. So you can access, when you go online, you, know, you can access that fund to trade for yourself, to put in your trade in the system. So, so in other words, you're saying that um, a, an individual cannot trade outside of a broker. No. I'm in Jamaica, you need a broker to trade. No, I'm saying that... You need a broker account to trade online. Okay, a broker account. Right. Okay, just want to so make that So you as an individual will put in your own order. Yes. So you will know how many stocks you want to buy, how much money you want to spend. That is your control. Mm -hmm. The broker account is on the f where the money is held. Okay. To fund that account to, I see. for the transaction. However, you, if, you're, if, you're a, if your account, if you have a stock portfolio, and you want to do a first transaction, which is a sell, you yes. don't necessarily have to have money in the account. Yes. Because when you sell, the account will be a fund. Will be funded by that, by that transaction. Got that. So don't necessarily have to wait to fund it if your first transaction is a sell. Yes. Because the sell amount can go into the account to I start to do mean. other things. I see what you mean. All right. So from your experience, Michael, what, what, or to what degree has the stock exchange improved the wealth um, the wealth of Jamaicans and the wealth creation opportunities of Jamaicans. Because we want here the real deal. Yeah, you open the accounts. Yeah, we fund it. Yeah, we use a broker. But talk to me nice now. How much money people make? How much money make can make? Like me putting my 10,000, you, 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 you mentioned about the select index, the top 15 um, stocks to trade on the, the JSC. Mm -hmm. How much money we can get in a real way? I mean, I know it's not an overnight success kind of story. But talk to me nice, Michael. I, I speak, How wealthy can I, I get from I, the I'll put exchange? it this way. I'll yes. put it this way. In between 2015 and 2018, junior market only, if you had invested in all the junior market companies within that time frame, you would have made over three over three hundred percent on your money mm. based on the growth rate of, of the stocks. Between which like years? Twenty seventeen to twenty eighteen. Oh, that's um, a, a period of a year. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But even longer term, because at that point, the junior market, in terms of the, ex I'm, I'm going to use this word now, the explosion of, oh, and, and I'll tell you as well that our data has shown that we have, we are, we are, we are, we have grown investors, local investors, right. significantly. Right. Um, we have, I'm sure, and I stand corrected, in the, I, I didn't bring my numbers with me, but I'm sure we have over, um, within the last year and a half. Yes. And let's take out the pandemic year. <laughs> Such no, year. No, Such year. Yeah, nobody used it to <laughs> yeah, really man. use 2020. Such year. Yeah, yeah man. Um, we would have seen significant, over 100 plus thousands of investors on board. Was this and, because and, and, of Wigton? It is, it is partially, but, but also persons don't come on board if they don't think there are opportunities in terms of benefit for them. Right. And, and, and that has shown where we have a number of, especially the age group, the millennials, 
I can tell you, we have seen millennials making significant amount of money. Yes. I remember they don't have money much to start because they just left university and yes. have debts to pay. Yes. And we have seen they're they are making a lot and they are very active. Okay. And, and that is an important factor in terms of the, the, the financial literacy. Yes. And of course... Um, as it relates to future growth of the market and for themselves. Okay. Uh, if you were to leave, you're, you're, you're about to leave us, but what would you like our viewers to understand about creating wealth through the stock exchange? If you were to tell them one thing, what would that be? I would say get financial literacy okay. at your forefront. Getting the information right the first time saves you the mistake that you may make down the road. Yes. The market is not a guarantee, mm -hmm. but it and stayed along all. Over time, you realize that, and, and it's not, the stock exchange says that, it, it, is, it is proven. Mm -hmm. Over time, the market will benefit you far better. It goes its peaks and trough, but at the end of the long haul, persons will be able to be. And, and, and my parting shot will be, mm -hmm. Get off the fence, get into the market. All right, okay. So that is your parting shot, ladies and gentlemen. Get off the fence, get into the market. All right, that is Michael Johnson. He is the senior marketing officer at the Jamaica Stock Exchange, and he, he gave us a second, second insight into how we can become wealthy. Participate on the stock exchange. All right, we are going to our next presenter, uh, and that is Melissa Golden from Law Insurance Brokers. La Melissa will talk to us about getting the best bang for your budget. But remember, there are some questions. There are some questions that we are going to engage our, our audiences. Uh, if you are joining on YouTube and Facebook, send the questions, send the answers to the questions in the chat. Uh, we're inside the Ministry of Finances inaugural Wealth Summit, streaming live from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel to the Ministry of Finance's Facebook page and YouTube channel. We're also streaming through the Jamaica Information Service, Facebook page and YouTube channels. All right. If you have a friend that you want to get exposed to this kind of information, call them quick. All right. Before we, before we introduce Melissa, remember that word that we spoke about? That word is PESIB. And we told you that P stands for protect. All right, so PESIB is actually the word meaning the, 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 the financial literacy components. So PESIB are the components of financial literacy, literacy. And the first component is protect, meaning protect your income. And one way of doing so is getting the best bang for your budget. And that is what Melissa Golden will speak to us about in the next presentation. Her mission is to empower Jamaicans to achieve financial security through education and access to tools for financial planning, investment, and wealth creation. She wants more Jamaicans to achieve wealth so that it can positively impact their life. She says that when, you earn, when you've earned your money, she can help it to put it to work for you by collaborating with you to achieve your goals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Melissa Golden, uh, financial advisor. Uh, she comes up now with getting the best bang for your budget. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for choosing taking the time out to join us today. And I mean, big up yourself for choosing to invest in your financial literacy. And investment in knowledge pays the best interest, right? So my presentation today is on getting the best bang for your budget. Let's jump right into it. Budgeting simply defined is creating a plan to spend your money, right? Good budgeting, however, is ensuring that you're spending less than you earn. I know budgeting can be hard. You make your budget and you find it difficult to stick to it, but it's one of the best ways to keep track of where your money is going every month, and then you can identify what changes you need to make 
in order to reach your financial goals. When making your budget, your budget should include things like your needs, your wants, your savings, your investments, and your emergency fund. So typically what we're saying is that your money monthly should be going towards savings, your bills and utilities, your insurance, and your emergency fund. You also would want to give, ensure that when you're making your budget, you give every dollar a job and keep track of your spending. As Shelly had mentioned earlier, you know when you have that magic money that just disappears on you, that is because you're not keeping track of your spending. Keep a financial journal if necessary. This will help to keep you on track and you can record and identify the things that you're actually spending your money on. So, one of the first things you'd want to do when you're creating your budget is create a financial plan. I mean, in order to get to a destination, you first have to know where you're going, right? Creating what are your goals? Creating a financial plan will help you to identify these goals and it will help you to map out the actions that you need to take towards achieving these goals. And please ensure that you put your short-term as well as your long-term goals in your financial plan. This will help you to achieve them faster. After you've created your financial plan, then you'd want to identify all your streams of income. Your streams of income is not only your nine to five, and that's a mistake that a lot of us make. What about your other passive incomes? What about the earnings you make from your skills? You might be getting an inheritance. You might be getting an annuity. You might be the type of person to buy and sell things. You have to account for every single dollar you make. And likewise, if you're going to account for all your earnings, you will also have to account for all your monthly expenses. And your monthly expenses is not only your utility bills. A lot of times we, we, we neglect to include the other things that we have to spend on. Sometimes the simple things like our personal care, your groceries, your hair care, your wants. Some of us have things that we have to do to maintain our mental health. Include those things in your budget. All things must be accounted for, so you identify where all your income is coming from and you identify all your expenses. So you've done all of that, right? But we're still having a problem because now you're still not saving any money and you still don't know, you're still living above, your, you're still spending more than you earn, so now Let's uncover some of those bad financial habits that are wrecking our financial future. And while it's easy to identify some of our big expenditures, sometimes it's uncovering some of those smaller, more sneakier daily expenses that will save you a lot of money in the long run. My first question to you is, are you paying your bills on time? Yeah, it can be easy to slip up every now and then and pay a bill late here and there. But these charges, these paying your bill late comes with penalty fees. And these fees add up. And frankly, I just think it's a waste of money. And what you don't realize is that a lot of companies actually pays you for paying your bill on time. So they'll reward you. That's like free money off your next utility bill. So find ways to pay your bill on time. Automate them if possible. As you get your paycheck, sometimes you get your paycheck the 25th of the month, even though your bill is not due until the 10th of the next month, you decide to wait. Why? Pay your bills and get it out of the way. Oh, let's visit some of our expensive food habits. A lot of us are guilty of these habits. We tend to constantly order takeout food, 
We like to eat out at these fine restaurants. We like to order the delivery meals. You're at work, you have to buy the lunch, and not only the lunch, sometimes you have to order breakfast as well. And of course, a lot of times, these comes with a delivery fee, and it ends up costing you twice the amount. No one is saying that you can't treat yourself from time to time. But cooking from home is an effective way to shrink your food, to shrink your food expenses. You can look at things like buying your produce from the market that saves you a ton of money what about trying to find the cheapest supermarket and we know some supermarkets are selling the same product for twice the amount how about buying in bulk some of the things that you know you use a lot of like your cleaning supplies your laundry detergent your canned products your canned goods these things can save you a lot of money in the long run Oh, how many of us are guilty of these? Or impulsive purchases? Splurging. <laughs> yes, we like to splurge. Some of us shop when we're bored. These spontaneous shop, um, shopping, these spontaneous purchases add up quickly and they can prove to be very expensive. Let me ask you a question. Think about this. Tell me you just get paid without telling me you get paid. I'll go first. Payday lunch. Come on. You know payday lunch has to be bigger than all the other lunches. And it has to turn up and you don't care if it's expensive. You don't care if it's eating out half of your food budget for the rest of the month. And you might end up buying, pat well, patty not so cheap anymore. But you know, you might end up have to be conserving more for the rest of the month. Think about it. What about shopping for status? Yeah, at times it can, get, it can be easy to get caught up in the celebrity fashion or shopping for trends. And do you really have to have the latest iPhone? I mean, how, man, how many of us are actually spending money to impress people that we don't know? Think about your purchases. And not just because something is on discount, it means that you have to take advantage of it. When making a purchase, I ask you, stop and think. Is it a want or a need? If it's a want, can you truly afford it? What is the true cost of this purchase? Will it be taking money out of your savings? Will you be racking up another debt? Hmm. If these questions cause you to pause and think about it, maybe you should consider holding off on the purchase. Another method you can try using, I saw a former coworker did this and I thought it was just brilliant. Try to think about, try to measure your purchases against your hours of work. For instance, you're earning $100,000. And this is assuming that you're Work week, you are working a 40 hour work week, right? So one hour pay is equivalent to $625. And oh, you see that handbag that you just have to buy and that slippers that you need because it's the slippers that he's wearing. And what about the guys? You know, you have to get the latest lights for the car because it has to be blinking and you have to put on the skirt and you have to ensure that you drop it low. I don't know why, because it ends up costing you more in front end parts. But think about the purchases. Spending $20,000, when you spend this money, you're actually paying with 32 hours of work. Is it really worth it? Oh gosh, not to mention the favorite place. I don't know what they put in the chicken. Maybe one day somebody can tell me what they're putting in the chicken. But consider how much you're actually spending. Some people have to go three, four times a week, or you have to ensure that you go at least one time a week. So if you're earning $70,000 to make a purchase for $2,000, and maybe that's one visit, you're actually paying with four and a half hours of work. Is it worth it? Think about it. 
The other thing that we tend not to do is prioritize paying off our debts. Debt is not only expensive, but it can have damaging emotional effects. I mean, at times you can feel like you're out at sea and you don't have any life raft because you're sinking and the interest rates are just piling up and it's taking longer and longer for you to pay off these debts. That's because your priorities are not right. With implementing the right debt payoff strategy, you can pay off your debt quickly, end up saving more, and you end up having more money towards your other financial goals. Prioritize paying off your debts. Things that we tend to let slip through as well. How many of us pay attention to how often we go to the ATM? Most banks have a charge that is associated with going to the ATM. Not to mention if you decide that you're going to use another bank's ATM because it's more convenient then you end up paying two or three times the amount. So you have to keep a close eye on your money, guys. You have to keep track of these fees, find ways to eliminate, to reduce the amount of time that you go to the ATM. Also, in keeping of your money, learn to review your bank statements. Fraud is abundant. And when you constantly review your bank statements, you can quickly catch on to unauthorized purchases. And it will also help you to identify some of these fees. When you actually see all the fees coming out of your bank account, you'd be surprised how much they add up to. Maybe you're paying fees that you're not supposed to be paying. A lot of people don't realize that the banks have different types of savings accounts and you're charged based on how you use that account. So when you, based on your spending pattern, you need to identify and choose the right savings account for how you operate. This will help to eliminate the amount of fees that are coming out of your account each month. And stop throwing away coins and change. Why would we like to throw away the little bit of money then? Tell you what, give yourself a challenge. Try to find, get your own coin saving trash can. Since it's trash, get a trash can. Throw all your coins, all your loose change, everything in that can. And at the end of the year, you realize how much money you're actually throwing away. Like I said, every dollar counts and everything adds up. And we need to start getting a handle on our finances. Review your expenses. Cutting out unnecessary expenses will actually help you to save a lot of money each month. I mean, look at things like your, your cable package. Do you have the right cable package? I know I don't watch movies on cable, so I don't need to get the cable bundle. So having that, having that additional amount on my cable is a waste of time, and those must add up. Find ways to reduce your electric bill. I know this is a hard one. But think about what you can do to actually get your bill down. How about getting a time saver for your fridge? We have moments, we have periods that we don't that we are not using, that we are not using our fridge. We can actually get a timer, set it to go off at those times, and this guys, it will actually drastically reduce your electric bills. Stop overspending. Bottle waters. Do we even think about how much money we spend on buying bottle waters every day? People like me, I can drink at least four bottles of water every day. And say, for instance, that's like, what, $100 for a bottle of water? That's $2,800 a week. That's $11,200 a month. Isn't that a hefty water bill? What I've done is that I've invested in one of those five-gallon water bottles because it costs like $300 to refill it, and you only have to refill it. Get your own personal water bottle so you can top up in the morning. It costs like $300 to refill it, and you probably only have to refill it two or three times for the month. It will help you to cut down drastically on the amount of money that you're spending. 
even your cups of coffee, you can look into that as well. And try not to buy more than you can eat. Racking up on your credit card bills. Credit cards can give you a false sense of how much money you actually have to spend. And constantly spending on credit without checking your budget or your ability to pay back can become one of the most expensive habits. Credit cards come with high interest rates. And paying the minimum payment doesn't help you because you charge interest on the reducing balance. Know your cycle. This can actually help you to pay off your, your bill in full each month and help you to reduce some of those interest rates. So let's quickly talk about some of the money habits that we need to develop. Pay yourself first. How many of us are accustomed to partners? No matter what, under in all conditions, you have to take out your partner money, right? Implement the same strategy. Take out money for your savings. Put it an invest in an investment account if you have to. Have a separate bank account, but pay yourself first. Build up on your retirement fund. Increase your deductions. This will, not help. this will not only help you to put more money towards your retirement saving, but it also reduces your taxable income. And try to make it at least the amount that your employer will match. That's like getting free money. Who doesn't want free money, right? Save for the future. Saying things like YOLO or FOMO can make you feel like you need to spend all your money now. But there needs to be a balance. At some point, you're going to want to purchase, you might want to purchase a house, maybe pay for your kids' tuition, or even retire. So when spending, there needs to be a balance. Enjoy your life now, but be sure that you're saving money for the future and working diligently towards your goals. Live below your means. If you're spending more than you earn, at some point, you're going to have to require credit to cover the rest. And like I said, credit, if not used properly, can, can become very expensive and it can be a trap. If you, need, if you find yourself having to spend, having to get credit to pay for basic things like your rent, buy new clothes or even a vacation, then you need to revisit what you're doing. Build up on your emergency fund. Plan ahead. If, we can't, if there's anything that we can count on, is that at some point or another, something is going to go wrong. Your car might break down. You might have an accident. You might have to fix or buy a new appliance. What about job loss? COVID has, COVID has surely highlighted that for us. So build up on your emergency fund. And so means that you need to plan for your quarterly expenses, such as your car insurance, service in your car, your holiday shopping, and your birthday outings, because some of us are big on birthdays, right? Like me. Grow your money by investing. Like my previous presenter said, you don't need a ton of money to start investing. To grow your money and create real wealth, you need to start investing. Invest your money and help to build up and secure your financial future. Last but not least, invest in a critical illness plan, guys. A lot of times, well, none of us plan to or want to get sick, but a medical bill can wipe out all our savings and still leaves us with a high medical bill that might take us years to pay off. So you want to ensure that you have money in the, in the event that you get sick. And what if you don't have any savings at the time? Where are you going to get the money from? Invest in your health and protect your, your portfolio by purchasing a critical illness plan. So I'll end by saying, not budgeting, not budgeting your money, combined with bad financial habits, not saving, can leave you vulnerable to unexpected emergencies, living from paycheck to paycheck, not to mention not having enough money for retirement. You can achieve your financial goals, it's just a matter of prioritizing sticking to your budget and tracking your spending. That is it from me. Ah, thank you so much, Melissa Golden, for those golden tips. Melissa, could you just join me um, for, for our post-presentation discussion?
So uh, if you're just joining us, this is the Minister of Finance's inaugural Wealth Summit. We're streaming live from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel via the Ministry of Finance's Facebook page and YouTube channels and Jamaica Information Services Facebook page and YouTube channel. All right, send your questions into the chat for Melissa if you have any. And if you wanna, if you wanna tag the Ministry of Finance because you enjoy, um, you've been enjoying the summit and particularly you have enjoyed Melissa's presentation, go ahead. Um, Ministry of Finance is on Twitter and on Instagram at MOF Jamaica. And you can also visit their Facebook page, Ministry of Finance. Melissa. Hi. <laughs> no, girl, I'm not lie. You drip me up. <laughs> you hold on my shirt. I have to go to the bathroom, go fix up my clothes. <laughs> Jeez. You couldn't take time with me. Well, remember, you're, you're in just, a crisis. You're you know? just talking oh. about the whole of my business. Jeez. I felt that payday lunch. <laughs> I feel the chicken. <laughs> I feel, <laughs> feel it when you talk. <laughs> oh, my God. But, but from your experience, though, how much money do we leak from our salaries, uh, salaries and earnings by, these, by, by, by perpetuating these kinds of habits? Sometimes a lot because... Uh, and a lot meaning, literally, give me an amount. You, you, you gave the example of the, 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 water, the, the bottled water consumption that can total about $11,000. How much money in a dollar figure we leak from our salaries unnecessarily? Well, it's, 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 it's hard to put an exact figure on it. Understand. Because, like I mentioned, even the late payment fees. $250, $250 per bill. Imagine you're paying five bills and you're paying all those five bills late. Yes. How much money is that? Yes. That That's money that you're being charged, mm -hmm. that money that you're being charged for late fees, you can actually get it to pay towards your next bill. Yes. So you need, to, you need to maximize on that. You need to take advantage of that. Right. Also, what you tend to find is that a lot of persons don't identify their expenses. Uh -huh. what yeah. they tend as as to you do, rightly said, yes. expenses are only utility bills. Yes. Mm -hmm. They only pay their utility bills and then it's whatever comes first. Mm -hmm. So they go out... They forgot that they forget that they have to pay their student loan. Mm. And of course, you know that 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 payday hangout where you <laughs> hang out with your friends and you're just buying food I and you're just drinking yes. and you're drinking as much Treat as you yourself. can. Oh gosh, Treat you're treating yourself. yourself. Yes. And then you wake up the next morning and you're like, you check your bank Sink account yourself. and you're like <laughs> How am I going to pay off these loans? Yes. So some of us find ourselves having to get another loan to pay off the loan. Yes. And this is the cycle. So we keep sinking ourselves deeper and deeper into debt. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say when you're making your budget, put your wants into your budget. Because you know you need to hang out. Right. Right? So mm -hmm. it has to be a part of your budget. Yes. If you know you need $5,000, budget at $5,000 and walk with that $5,000. Mm -hmm. Because when that money finish, mm -hmm. you have to stop spending. Mm. So you have to find ways to control your spending. Okay. Leave the debit card at home. No, Melissa. You're going too hard now. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. You stop that. <laughs> you stop that. Which debit card? Leave the debit and they, the credit card they, at home. They get vexed. Credit card. No, man. Debit card. Just, just pull the $5,000 that mm -hmm. you need. Mm -hmm. Pull the $5,000 that you need. Mm -hmm. However amount your spending is that you have allocated for your wants, pull that amount of money and just walk with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, but, but of course, you are giving us what I would call golden tips, right? Yes. Um, you, you did mention that one of the most important things we can do in managing money is to pay ourselves first, first right? Yes. That's our rich dad, poor dad um, concept, paying ourselves first. Uh, what do you say to the persons who pay themselves first by treating themselves to that payday hangout, to that um, payday lunch to that payday line. Um, how can they convert? It's not easy to change behavior, but how can they convert um, that to, to, a, to a mindset of paying yourselves first with money, not expenses? Well, you have to save, right? And if you're budgeting properly, like I said, you'll be paying yourself first, which you'll be taking out some form a portion of your salary towards your savings and you'll be allocating money for your expenses because your wants is an expense. So it's because you're not budgeting properly because if you're budgeting properly, then the two won't intertwine. 
Okay, before I ask you my, my last question, viewers, uh, remember we have, a, we have questions and their prize is courtesy of the Ministry of Finance. I have two questions at this time. My first question is, what is the name of the Jamaica Stock Exchange's um, online trading platform? And my second quiz, my second question <laughs> <laughs> is, what is the first thing you should do when you get your earnings or your Salary. salary. What is the first thing you should do when you get your earnings or your salary? And the other question, what is the name of the Jamaica Stock Exchange's online trading platform? Send your questions into the chat, Facebook, YouTube, and my social media coordinator will tell me who first has the answers. All right? Melissa, yes. my last question. What, why is financial literacy important? And I wanted to give uh, my viewers... A, Practical advice. How does one budget? Believe it or not, there are some persons who literally don't know how. How does one budget and why is financial literacy important as we close this discussion? Well, the first question, financial literacy is important because it helps you to identify, one, how money works. And once you've identified how money works, then you can let it work for you. So you can know how credit work, you can know how savings work, you can know how investing works. And once you've invested time into acquiring this knowledge, I mean, use your smart device, learn, Google some things, YouTube some things. There are a lot of experts that are online that are actually giving you free advice on how to manage your money. Learn how money works. Budgeting, what was the other question? Uh, uh, literally. How does how one create a budget? How one yeah, create a budget. Right. Well, you can try to use a template mm -hmm. to create a budget. And like I said, um, identify your income, all your expenses, all your wants, and record it. You cannot make a budget record without writing it down. So you know that, oh, I spend this every month on utilities and I spend that. But that's how you don't know where your money is going for all the other expenses. So write down everything. Record your budget. Pencil it out, income, expenses, savings, investments. Even if you're doing your budget and you have a wish then, you wish to put this amount of money towards savings and you're not doing it at the moment. Once you've created that budget and you've identified where all your money is going, mm -hmm. this will help you to identify areas in which you can cut back on and help you to better work towards your financial goals. All right, well said. Um, thank you so much, Melissa Golan. She's of a law um, insurance broker. She's a financial advisor. She gave us some golden tips on how to get the best bang for your budget. You will be surprised at how many leaks are in, in your, your earnings yeah. and your salaries. So my advice to you, my viewers, stop those leaks, all right? Put NWC on your salary. Put NWC <laughs> on your earnings. Stop those leaks. All right? Reduce the payday treat mentality. I'm sure it is difficult to overcome, but we can do it. Pay bills on time. And most importantly, pay yourself first. It could be as simple as just putting aside a percentage of your salary and you just go on with yourself with the rest. All right, but Melissa did give us some useful and practical tips on how to get the best bang for our budget. All right, did anybody, thank you so much, Melissa, did anybody answer the questions on social media? Uh, yes, while, while my social media um, co coordinator feeds me the, the responses, um, our next presenter is Sheldon Christian uh, from the First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union. The questions are, the questions are, what is the name of the Jamaica, Jamaica Stock Exchange's online trading platform? And the second question, what is the first thing you should do when you get your earnings or your salary? I use earnings in the instances of business, small business um, persons, and salaries for those who are employed. Do we have our answers? Yes. 
Twila Ajwa Kanji. Did I get that correct? J Trader Pro. Pro. All right. So Twila Ajwa Kanji. I, you know, I really can't see you, <laughs> but I hope you are seeing me, Twila. Um, you got the answer correct. That is J Trader Pro. And does anybody have an answer for the second question, Kim? All right, while Kim finds the answer for the, the second question, uh, allow me to congratulate Twilla. You win yourself a gift package from the Ministry of Finance. Um, it includes some really cool stuff, water bottles, um, piggy banks, and other things that you find useful. Those things will help you to improve your wealth. You see the water bottle? Put water in it. And about that buy a of bottle water. You see the savings plan? Put the money. Look kind them, put them in there. Yeah, throw them out a month time or a year time. All right? And that is how, those are the simple steps we can use to continue this journey of wealth creation. Allow me now to introduce our next presenter, Sheldon Christian. Uh, he's the first, he's the branch manager for the Spanish, Spanish Town branch of the First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union. He has served First Heritage since 2004 after having joined from the former GSB Cooperative Credit Union. Uh, Sheldon started at the, at, the very, at the very bottom. He was a teller, and he was promoted very quickly to head teller. In 2015, he moved up the rank to the role of branch supervisor and then branch manager in 2018. Uh, Sheldon is a Calabar old boy, uh, any Calabar people on the live in here? Yes, watch our run up and down. <laughs> right, so he's a, he's a Calabar old boy and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Production Operations Management and International Business from the University of Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome First Heritage's Branch Manager of the Year for 2019-2020, Sheldon Christian. All right, good, good, good afternoon, host, uh, Ms. Anna Smith, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my fellow, fellow panelists, employees from the public sector, and everyone tuning in on the various social media platforms. But first, I want to thank the MOFPS for inviting First Heritage Credit Union on board today. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us. And um, I can't say thank you enough. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and of course, we have some wonderful information that I want to convey to the audience today. Uh, my topic, of course, is bargains that make a difference. Um, and of course, I hope that after completing this presentation, you will be informed about a, a number of bargains that we have at First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union, or FHC. But before I get into it, um, I just want to share our mission statement at First Heritage Cooperative and our philosophy. And our mission statement states, to offer superior value to our members by providing innovative products and services through effective and efficient service delivery, while creating opportunities that will motivate team members and enhance the communities in which we operate. Of course, proudly, we at FHC believe firmly in our mission statement. But I just want to point out another thing, where FHC's philosophy is our member at the center. And I want to reiterate that our member at the center, we are big on our philosophy. The members are our, are our primary focus. They are why we are in business. So, of course, they are the reason why we exist. So the members are our primary focus. Like I can't say it enough. So our philosophy, again, is our member at the center focus. Um, just briefly, I'm going to quickly just give you a, a brief background of the FHC um, Cooperative Credit Union. First Heritage Credit Union was initially formed via merger in 2012 between, between Churches Cooperative Credit Union and GSB Cooperative Credit Union. St. Thomas Cooperative later came on board in 2015. FHC's bond <coughs> covers all civil servants 
And of course, this is a Ministry of Finance event, so I, I want the civil servants to listen out carefully. They, they could cover all civil servants, staff within the statutory bodies and their public corporations, their spouses, relatives, we're not leaving out the family at all, all members of any religious bodies and affiliations in Jamaica, and the relatives and persons who live, work, and do business in St. Thomas, as well as their families. We're not leaving out the families at all. We currently serve over 200,000 members through a network of 11 locations island-wide. Yes, we cover almost the entire Jamaica from the Montego Bay end to St. Thomas. We offer a wide array of products and services, which includes loans, savings, and insurance. These products are specifically designed to meet the needs of our members. And I remember I did say we have a philosophy where the member is at the center. So the members at every stage of their lives, we cover them. Whether they are just starting out or are financially savvy and investment oriented, our commitment remains to generate continual benefits to our members and other stakeholders by continuously promoting Swifty habits. But of course, um, I don't want to stray from the point because, of course, my topic still remains bargains that make a difference. So, quickly, I just want to get into what a bargain is. Um, and a bargain is a statement which contains an explicit and conditional offer. The conditions on the offer is always specific. Please remember that. It is an agreement between two or more people or group. And this point is very important that is coming up. Something costing much less than normal, that is a bar bargain. When we talk about or discuss a bargain in our Jamaican context, we are talking about a deal for your money. And of course, um, some of my fellow presenters would have mentioned a couple of deals and, and so on and so forth. So a deal for your money is also a bargain. More savings to put in your pocket. The best way to stretch your money and of course, Melissa spoke about that a while ago, stretching that dollar and make it work for you. That's also a bargain. Of course, as Jamaicans, we all love a good bargain. Uh, do you agree? Of course, we love a good bargain. So here are some pros and cons of bargaining from the customer's viewpoint. Pros. Number one, financially, you're, save, you're saving money. You're saving money, and that is a good thing. Emotionally, you're getting a discount that makes you feel good about the purchase or a transaction. Yes, you have secured the deal of the century. And I can just give you an example quickly. Sometimes you're getting a deal, probably a, a motor vehicle sale, someone who is leaving the, the island and, you, you know, a car valued at probably $2.4 million because the person is, is migrating in a hurry. They, they, they are selling the car for $1.8 million. Of course, that's a bargain and that's a deal of any century of any lifetime. So you'd have to run with a deal like that. Next is the affordability. You can afford to buy something that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. That's a bargain. You can afford to buy something that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. The cons, of course, I just mentioned the pros. We're getting into the cons now. The cons, of course, within a bargain, it's time sensitive. Yes, you might not be able to secure that same exact deal at another time because... It's time-bound. There's a disagreement. The process might be time-consuming if both parties are not on the same page with the terms of the transaction or agreement. Impulse spending. Melissa mentioned that a while ago. Impulse spending. You, it could encourage someone to make that impulse splurge that might not be otherwise been made. So I'm going to quickly, of course get into some bargains that we have at First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union. Um, and I'm going to start by just listing them quickly. We have a summer, summer loan seal. We have a match it home, home loan. We have what we call a family indemnity plan, or the acronym is FIP. We have a life savings insurance. We also have a loan protection insurance, the golden harvest savings, and the interest first deposit. So, of course, you'd want, and I'm sure you, 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 you are in, immediately interested in what these bargains are. But firstly, in order to get access to some of these bargains at First Heritage, 
we, you're wondering how to get the bargains right away. Yes, you must become a member of First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union in order to get access to some of these bargains. And, and, and getting on board on First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union is very, very simple. Because I'm a simple guy myself, so we try to keep it simple. So in opening an account, all you need to qualify you is just to complete a membership application, a valid ID and TRN, proof of address, two references, proof of employment, and a membership fee of $3,700. It's that simple. So first, I'm going to quickly speak about our summer loan sale, which has our motor vehicle loan um, in this sale as a bargain. So we are offering up to 100% financing. That is one. We, up to 10 years, you have up to 10 years to repay the loan. That is two. And number three, number three is a, is a, is a seller. 50% reduction in the processing fee. You can't get it any better. And we have cars up to 10 years old. And I'm, I'm sure my audience is now checking or doing the math of what your vehicle that goes down to. I think, as I said, I'm a simple guy. You can go back to basis. Um, call yourself one, and then you can come back down from 2021 all the way down. But I can quickly calculate it for you. you we go all the way down to 2012 vehicles. So I did say 10, year, 10 years old. We have interest rates as low as 6.99%. And I can tell you, it cannot get any better. Talk about a bargain. Number two, we have what we call the Magic Home Loan. Um, and this loan is specifically designed for our first-time home owners. We, it's an, at an attractive interest rate of 6% per annum. Um, it's a 95% financing loan. And of course, it's a conglomerate between ourselves and NHD. Um, it's available to any single or joint applicants. Of course, yourself can, can apply or yourself and your spouse or your significant other can also apply and get access to this benefit. And we will match your NHT benefit up to $6.5 million. So it's easy access. Just come on down to FHC. Big bargain. Next is our family indemnity plan. And this one um, I'm very passionate about. Why? Because, as a matter of fact, before I get into the why, well, let me just quickly tell you about it um, so we can get into that. It protects up to six family members and it, you know, insured six family members. So we have different um, premiums with benefits. So the, the minimum amount for any one premium is Yes, I, I didn't stutter. It's as low as $422.40 for one premium. And that one low premium covers yourself and five other family members. The five other family members, they can include your spouse or your significant other. They can include parents or parents-in-law and that one plan. And let me tell you, that one plan, that is just a plan A of seven other plans available for this family indemnity plan. And it's geared towards funeral expenses. So whenever there's a death in the family, the FIP covers the expenses. And you don't need a medical exam a examination to, 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 to get access to this, this product. Very simple, very easy. Again, it's a bargain like no other. For me, I have experienced where I've seen persons coming into our locations whenever they have a death in the family. And that's a, that's a point that they just start planning for the death. Can you imagine? They're walking to the location and they're crying, you know, lying on the ground and so on, rolling all over the place. And that is at the point where they are just planning for the death. And that is at the point now where they're scratching their heads, wanting to take out a loan to bury this family member, when you could have just simple had a FIP with a low, a low premium as $422.40. There are several other premiums. I can, I can name them. $633.60 for a plan B. $792 for a plan C. $1,320 for our plan D, $2,112 for our plan E, $3,432 for our plan F, and $5,280 for our plan G. And that benefit for the plan G is a million dollars, people. So you can just imagine if you can just budget for any one of these plans, you can benefit from the FIP for funeral expenses. I, I re I'm really passionate about the FIP, so that's why I, I spoke about it so long. Um, at FHC, we have what we call the life savings insurance because a number of our members and even potential members, they are not 
aware that the savings, there's an insurance aspect of the savings where your savings is insured up to a certain amount. So, of course, the more you save, the more insurance coverage you receive. You are insured in the event of death, whether natural or accidental or dismemberment. You enjoy additional insurance coverage at no direct cost to you. So that's a bargain. I'm not sure if um, other financial institutions offer that kind of insurance for your saving. Um, we also have um, on board the loan protection insurance, where the loan protection insurance, again, your loan is insured up to a certain amount. And FHC um, covers a part of that amount for you. So the loan protection is available to all credit union members under 70, 70 years old. You enjoy additional insurance coverage at no direct cost to you. And, of course, FHC pay, pays a portion of that premium. Total and permanent disability is covered if the disability occurs before the age of 60. So you take out a loan at FHC, don't, 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 don't be worried, don't be scared. We cover a portion of that um, loan for you with the protection insurance. Next is another product that I really, 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 I don't want to be biased, but it's another product that I'm also passionate about too, and it's our Golden Harvest Savings Plan. Our Golden Harvest Savings Plan it's a long-term, goal-oriented product, and it, you just need $1,000 to open this, this, this account to get a goal in Harvest Savings. And the term is between a year and up to 10 years. The interest is paid monthly at a rate of 4.5% per annum. That's incredible, people. 4.5% in this, in this lifetime, it's, it's a whole lot. So the goal in Harvest, you can... Plan for the Golden Harvest, it's a, it's a product that you can use to plan for a house, plan for a car. If your children, you want to assist your children in getting married, you can, there are so, several different things that you can use the Golden Harvest Savings product to do. And it's insured for up to $4.5 million, but I've not mentioned the, the, the real deal in the Golden Harvest just yet. Let me tell you. The Golden Harvest Savings Plan, right? You see, if you... It allows you to retire in comfort, I can tell you. It, 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 you just need to come in, sit down with one of our representatives. We can work out a payment plan for you in terms of what you identify as your goal. So, for example, if you identify a goal of $500,000 that you want to save within 12 months, we can then tell you how much you need to save monthly to get to that goal. But here's the good part of it. If you die, so um, you pay the first payment, payment or premium up front, and you die, you know, God's will, you die within a month or two, and your goal was initially $500,000, your beneficiary still gets that goal of $500,000. So I can tell you, and even if you become disabled, and you just, you only pay that first, for example, $10,000 is a premium, and you pay that $10,000, you still will be rewarded the amount of $500,000 as the insurance amount. So I tell you, the goal in our savings product, if that's not a bargain, you tell me what is a bargain. Next, we have what we call interest-first deposit. And with the interest-first deposit, um, I can safely say it's the first of its kind in Jamaica. We, of course, we know that when we have savings products, our savings instrument, you get your, you get your interest at the end of that saving, but with the interest first deposit, you get the interest at immediately upon making that deposit. You get the interest, I, I, I listen, let me repeat, you get the interest immediately upon making that deposit. So you don't have to wait until the end of the period for us to pay you that interest. We give you the interest up front. So, of course, it's now back to school, and I know a number of parents are probably running around running around to see how they can get some, get some funds and all of that to, you know, cover the, the school, back to school expenses. You can get, bring, bring your savings from any other institution to First Heritage and we give you the interest up front so you can use that interest and cover the back to school expenses. You open it just a minimum amount of $100,000 and the term is one year and as again, you receive the interest right away. So, we are at the end, um, and of course, I just want to, again, say, I can't say it enough, thank you 
to the Ministry of Health and the public sector for inviting us. Um, First Heritage Credit Union is an awesome institution, so please come on down to any one of our um, locations island-wide. We are covered uh, uh, from St. James to St. Thomas. Um, the, the, our contact information is 929-5142. That's our member care center. Um, our toll-free number is 1-888-225-5472. Um, our WhatsApp call line is 551-8193. And of course, you can also email us www.fhccu.com or at info at fhccu.com. Of course, we are also on various social media platforms, IG, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We are all there. We are easy access. We are available to you. Come on down to any one of our locations. We are here for you. Thank you. All right, that was Mr. Sheldon Christian. No doubt you recognize why he is or was the 2019-2020 branch manager of the year for First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union. He spoke about, spoke about getting bargains that make a difference. No, we want to talk to Sheldon a little bit more. We have a few questions for him. Mr. Calabar, sir. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Mr. Wiley, I present to them and say, yes, watch branch manager, <laughs> watch salesman, <laughs> 622 for a plan, B, for a plan A, 1,000 for a plan B, yes, straight man. up to yeah. G. Yes, man, straight <laughs> That's up to the G. alphabet plan. Yes. All right. Well, those sound to me like very good financial um, bargains, yes. um, I, I would say. Yes. And what, what I really took from your, from your presentation in terms of the presentation of the of the financial products was really, it really embodied what financial inclusion is all about. Yes. Creating financial services that the ordinary Jamaican needs. Yes. All right. So, so FIP for those persons who would not have known about the family indemnity plan, as Sheldon says, is geared toward um, funeral expenses, final expenses, as they are sometimes called. And the plan G gives you a million dollars. All right. So let us do it from 100,000, 500,000, a million. Tell me what is the, how much is a plan for 100,000? All right. So as I said before, the, 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 the plan C. Yes. The plan C, the premium is $792 monthly. Yes. Um, and the benefit is $150,000. $150,000. All right. right. What is, the, what is the, the premium for a $500,000 plan? All right. So the premium for a $500,000 plan, um, quickly, that falls into mind. That would be, we, we, we don't have a $500,000 plan. Oh, you plan. don't, right. actually. But we have one for a $650,000 okay. benefit. Okay. And we also have one for a $400,000 benefit. Okay. And the premiums for those are? So the $400,000 benefit is $2,112 monthly. Yes. As low as $2,112. Yes. And the six hundred and fifty thousand dollar benefit mm -hmm. is three thousand four hundred and thirty two dollars monthly. And the and the million dollar benefit is the million million dollar benefit. The the premium is five thousand two hundred and eighty dollars. All right. So for as little as five thousand two hundred and eighty dollars, you can get an FIP plan, which could cover final expenses. How many how many family members does the FIP cover? It covers up to six family members. Six family members. Right. And is it that, um, God forbid, knock on wood, <laughs> is it that for each family member that becomes deceased, you, if, for example, if you have the million dollar plan, yes. you get a million for each, or is it a total of a million? No, for each family member. Yes. Talk yes, to me nice. Yes. Let me just drop it. I'm yes, sure. so fix up yourself, Miss Are yes, you serious? Yes, Miss Okay, so that is really right. that is really a bargain. Definitely. And a that bargain. replicates itself for all the other plans. You yes. get that amount for each person that becomes deceased. Yes, Miss Okay, so that is one of the bargains that I was interested in uh, in probing. They they then there's a summer loan and there's mm -hmm. a magic home loan. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the key creators of wealth is real estate. Yes. All right. Um how how, from your experience as a branch manager, you deal with the ordinary Jamaican, the yes. ambitious Jamaican. All right, sometimes the Jamaican that doesn't have it quite together, yes. you know, but after coming out of your office, 
And after you give them the talk, Mr. Rabalak, <laughs> <laughs> they don't remain the same. <laughs> so That's from your experience, yes. um, what is home ownership take up like? And um, how, how does the magic home loan make home ownership that much easier? It, it makes it very easy. I, I like that question. It's a very good question. It makes it very easy because what, from my experience, I've realized that a number of Jamaicans, you know, sometimes we, we tend to find it difficult mm -hmm. to come up with that deposit yes. amount. That's the first thing. So what I normally advise my members to do is to start with a golden harvest plan. Yes. Because remember, the golden harvest is a long-term savings oriented plan right where you can tell yourself so listen all right i'm going to try and access a home within the next 12 months so you can start with the golden harvest plan to to get that initial deposit and so, then know so so is it that the the magic home you still you still require a deposit yes what how much deposit uh it's a 95 percent financing between Nine, so between ourselves and nhd okay so you're going, you need a deposit of about five so when you're going to move to the hundred percent financing well, it's something that we, we, we are currently um, discussing. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, the executive management and the branch management in collaboration, of course, we, with we, the NHD. We, with, of course, with NHD, we'll see how best we can come up so with something in the near future. Right, because, because you know, there's, a, there's, there's this concept of money called the time value. Yes. All right. Yes. So in this month, it's August 2021, I see a wicked deal on an apartment. Yes. Yeah? I don't have that 5%. I'm rude, you know. You know what I mean? I'm <laughs> rude. I know it's my fault. But right. I'd like to access that house. Right. Yeah? So, so, so a 100% financing option would be best for me to, to take advantage of that opportunity now. Right. But as it stands, I still need 5%. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, please to put on the money. Um, Melissa Golden told you how you can stop the leaks from your salary. Reduce, reduce, reduce. Right? No, um, Sheldon is telling you the bargains that you can take advantage of through the credit union network. Yes. And not only, not only First Heritage, if I may say, yes. but most other credit unions offer these kinds of financial product bargains. Right? So there's a 95% um, financing on your home. Right. All right, that's another bargain. Mm -hmm. And you, you spoke about what I was interested, mm -hmm. much interested in, is the interest first savings. Mm -hmm. All right, that you get the interest at the front, yes. and can we use the interest? Yes, you can. Yes. So, so how is the, What is the interest rate? I should ask. All right, the interest rate varies because we, it's on a tiered amount. Yes. So the interest rate varies based on the amount that you deposit. Okay. So, um, it's a minimum of a hundred hundred thousand dollars. So yes. if you decide to 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 deposit a five hundred thousand, then of course the interest rate will vary based on the amount you you deposit. All right. So so but you can tell me an example of an interest rate on a five hundred thousand dollar deposit. Um, a five hundred thousand dollar deposit. Uh, the interest rate for twelve months. Uh, it's somewhere between uh, probably two point eight to three percent. Two point eight. So up front, up front, you get two point eight percent of that five hundred thousand yes. dollars, and that you can use immediately. Even toward expenses, Any, but no matter use it in the expense people. We're talking about wealth creation. Please invest it. Um, you remember Michael Johnson gave you some stock exchange tips earlier. All right. Um, my final question, um, as we wrap up with a minute to go, yes. financial literacy. Why is it important? And you can give me actual examples from your time at First Heritage. All right. It, it's it's very important because it equips you with the knowledge and the skills in terms of how you deal with money on a whole. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, some of my previous pre presenters would have mentioned a number of ways how you can deal with money. But when you're financial literate, it, it, it guides you, it molds you into a different human being where you don't spend loosely, you don't spend widely, you, 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 you keep it on a budget, on a tight budget. So you keep it within your realms of what you can afford. So financial literate is a big, big topic. Um, it's a very good one. And um, if all Jamaicans can be financial literate, we'll be a better, better, in a better place. And a growing economy. Thank you so much, um, Sheldon Christian. That was Sheldon Christian. He is branch manager for the Spanish Town branch of First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union, giving us from bargains, um, bargains that make a difference. Now, all right, you remember that word that we're learning today? PESIB, all right, P-E-S-S-I-B. 
passive is actually the components of financial literacy. All right, the first component is protect, that is protect your income. All right, Melissa would have told us how to do that. The second component is to earn. Um, so Michael would have given us an option of how mm -hmm. to earn. Ah, the, the third component is saving. All right, back again to Melissa. The fourth component is spending. All right, so when we spend money, we have to spend money deliberately. Every spend should benefit us in terms of long-term wealth. All right, so we've covered the first four. PESIB, P is for protect your income. E is to earn additional income, save that income, but spend it wisely, all right? Throughout the rest of today's summit, we will learn what I and B stands for. Now, we have a question. Um, we have a winner for a previous question. That um, Let me get back to my notes here. All right, so the question was, what is the first thing you should do when you get your earnings or your salary? And the winner for that question was Nisi. Is that correct, Kim? Nisi. Um, she, she's join, she joins us from the JIS, um, JIS Facebook. Uh, Nisi, you win for yourself, courtesy of the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, a gift yeah. package that includes <laughs> a savings bank and a water bottle and other things that you will find useful. All right, if you are just joining us, we are broadcasting live from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. We're broadcasting to the Ministry of Finance Facebook page and YouTube channel, also the JIS's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you'd like to tag the ministry, um, you, can, you can follow them on Instagram and Twitter at MOF Jamaica. But remember, please use the hashtags Wealth Summit 2021, hashtag, I beg your pardon, hashtag Wealth Summit 2021, hashtag Wealth Summit, or hashtag Investing in Jamaicans. The theme for this month is Making Every Cent Count. And we will be learning from Mr. David Geddes just shortly. Mr. David Geddes is from the is from the Financial Services Commission. And he is presenting to us today on saving money for a rainy day. That was yesterday <laughs> when Grace started the felt. All right. Um, David Geddes, he was the chief executive officer of the Guyana-based organization of Caribbean Utility Regulators, OCUR. He also held senior positions in the National Water Commission and the offices of utility, the office, I beg your pardon, of utilities regulation. He has a master's in business administration and is a certified regulation specialist. He's also a Fulbright alumni, having been selected as a Hubert Humphrey Fellow, the University of Washington, Seattle, where he pursued studies in macro microeconomic policy analysis. He has extensive cross-cultural and international experience. And good day, colleagues and participants. Let me first thank the Minister of Finance and the Public Service for organizing this timely event. This is actually your government and public sector working for you. Today, I'll be sharing with you thoughts on not just saving for a rainy day, but preparing yourself for that rainy day and defining what that rainy day is. Decades ago, maybe even eons ago, there were two hit songs, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, B.J. Thomas, and Peter Potter by Jamaican crooner Ernie Smith. Now, raindrops keep falling on my head, but that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. Crying's not for me, because I'm never going to stop the rain by complaining, because I'm free, nothing's worrying me. Of course, I wasn't going to try and sing that for you, I'm just reading that for you. A few things come to mind. 
The raindrops are falling on my head. There's no roof. I'm outside in the elements. And very importantly, I'm never going to stop the rain by complaining. It's never too early to start planning for that rainy day. Whether it be retirement, an accident, or a loss of a job, life happens. Your circumstances can change in an instant. Yes, it may be nice to win one of the lotto jackpots and experience an epiphany of luxury. But chances are you'll more likely be faced with a calamity that requires a hefty outpouring of funds. That will be your rainy day. Now, have you ever been inside on a rainy night, holding your baby tight? Well, I have. Have you ever had your dreams, long-forgotten schemes coming true? It seems that I have. Those lyrics from Ernest Smith's Peter Patter. He is inside on a rainy night, much better than being outside in the elements. Also, his dreams and long-forgotten schemes are coming true. We have to plan from day one of earning for our future. Rainy days, sunny days, inside or outside, crying and complaining won't help. Now, the mid-1990s, 1996 to 1999, was a tumultuous period in the Jamaican financial sector, so much so that the Jamaican government saw no alternative but to intervene. Merchant and commercial banks, life insurance companies, and a general insurance company were at impending and growing risk of insolvency. The crisis spread across the island and was threatening to negatively impact the economic well-being of the Jamaican citizens. Now, from the intervention by the Jamaican government came the Financial Services Commission. That was the Act of 2001, and it was a remarkably significant day in the history of the Jamaican financial sector. The FSC came into existence with a mandate to supervise and regulate Jamaica's on-deposit-taking financial institutions in the financial sector. So FSC is this month and year celebrating our 20th anniversary. The brightest of minds from around the financial sector were assembled to become the bedrock of the FSC. We brought in persons from the Securities Commission, the Office of the Superintendent of Insurance, the Financial Sector Adjustment Company, and other institutions, all in one place for one purpose, to promote integrity in the Jamaican financial sector and protect consumers of financial services. The period 2000 to 2000, 2004 to 2005 was also an important chapter in the history of the FSC. The Pensions Act came into being, and this officially designated pensions as a financial service for the purposes of the FSC Act. Now, the FSC was also designated as the competent authority for securities, dealers, and insurance companies under the Proceeds of Crime Act of 2007. As the organization continued to grow and evolve over the past 20 years, it has sought to capitalize on its power and influence, not only as a regulator, but also as an educator through programs such as the Youth Focused Schools Financial Education Program, SFEP, developed in partnership with Junior Achievement Jamaica, which delivers knowledge that is essential for developing healthy financial attitudes and behaviors. This is done as an extracurriculum activity over a six-week period each school year. The FSC also frequently collaborates with other regulatory bodies, such as the Bank of Jamaica, and engages the services of media houses across all media on, a ver on various financial literacy initiatives targeted at both the industry as well as the wider public. More recently, the FSC has also adopted a strong social media presence across several online platforms. This as we continue to engage with our stakeholders to deliver meaningful financial and other pertinent information. The Commission is also looking now to enhance its financial group supervision and crisis resolution framework and practices through the procurement and implementation of new software that will facilitate faster data collection from regulated industries and enable greater and timelier analysis of the financial soundness and risk exposure. Now, how does the FSC help the man in the street or the woman in the street. Along with supervision, monitoring, and licensing, 
This is to maintain the health, stability, and public confidence in the industries we regulate. The FSC is also focused on educating and empowering consumers, particularly our youth, to make financial decisions that can move them forward. We have long recognized that there are significant gaps in financial knowledge, behavior, and attitude, and these heighten the potential for missteps in our financial marketplace, which grows more complex. We are working to protect consumers both from the market conduct viewpoint as well as the perspective of individual responsibility. The FSC also accepts and investigates complaints against operators in the securities, insurance, and private pension industries. Now, what actually is financial literacy? Financial literacy has been defined as knowledge of basic financial concepts and the skills and attitudes to translate that knowledge into behaviors that improve financial outcomes. The FSC is pursuing a multi-stakeholder approach designed to highlight the opportunities and challenges that we all face throughout our financial lives. Now, in terms of budgeting and saving, it may not seem like it, but we practice budgeting every day alongside cost-benefit analysis. In other words, in every transaction that we make, we subconsciously make a rough budget in our minds that allows us to know if a purchase is worth it or not. Budgeting is an essential human tool, and it is a cornerstone of human sustenance. Budgeting tells us what we have, and what we don't have, what we need, and what we don't need. It separates the wants from the needs and allows us to make decisions on resources based on that distinction between our wants and our needs. We need to budget, we tend to budget regularly, most notably with our earnings. We assess the bills that need to be paid, the food that needs to be bought, the cost of transportation, and any other essential need that will incur cost. However, it is always best to have a budget with structure that allows for the needs of the present and the needs of the future. Building a budget that clearly details what your needs are and their associated costs can help you to make more room for planning for the future by putting money into things like saving and investing. It is very important that you try your best to implement saving in your budget for any future plans or emergencies that may require additional resources. Saving money for a rainy day is a part of what is called financial resilience, which is the ability not to be unduly financially affected by times of uncertainty, such as natural disasters, illness, or other unfortunate events. Having a budget that can allow you to be financially resilient and also supports your needs of today is an important foundation of building personal wealth. It will help you provide provide for you and your plans a launch pad that will minimize or mitigate potential risk and the resulting fallout from that risk. Now, the role of the financial services in the insurance sector is very critical. Under the Financial Services Commission Act and the Insurance Act 2001, the Financial Services Commission is responsible for the supervision of all life and general insurance companies and insurance in intermediaries. It is also the role of the FSC to ensure policyholder protection through a system of regulation and supervision. This supervision is directed from the insurance division of the FSC. So the F the, that division monitors the insurance industry to ensure that solvency standards for all entities are met, the relationships between insurance and their holding subsidiary and or associated companies are in accordance with the legislation, and most importantly, that policyholders have access to information. Industry players must practice good corporate governance as they owe a duty of care to their clients. As at September 2020, there were a total of 17 insurance companies operating in Jamaica, while 19 were registered. Life insurance companies account for 79% of the insurance sector's total assets, while general insurance companies account for the remaining 21%. And let's also look at microinsurance. Microinsurance is insurance coverage designed and targeted to the low income or underserved population. 
These are some of the main features of the microinsurance business. A, the perils covered, if materialized, would severely impact the insurance, the insured's livelihood. The annual premium should not exceed more than the minimum monthly wage pursuant to the current National Minimum Wage Act. And the policy duration should not exceed one year, but may be renewed at the end of each year. You can find more information on, on our website, www.fscjamaica.org. With microinsurance forming a part of Jamaica's national financial inclusion strategy, it could be possible to increase the level of insurance coverage across the island. Now, microinsurance should be able to assist, for instance, those raft persons on the Rio Grande in, in my hometown, uh, home parish, Portland, and those on the Martha Bray in Trelawney. It should also help farmers whose income is sporadic and based on, on the reaping and sale of crops. So in planning for those rainy days, it is critical that you ensure your assets, your life, your home, your vehicle, your health, are just some of the insurable assets that you should invest in. In fact, even if you are living in rented premises, you can get insurance for the furniture that you own. That rainy day may very well be a hurricane, and of course we're in the hurricane season currently, and will remain so until the end of November. And when you purchase your dream home, or any home for that matter, and you have finished the mortgage payments, you should maintain insurance coverage in case of a rainy day. And we saw a rainy day yesterday, as our host Anna spoke about. So that rainy day can be any time. Another saving for rainy day is retirement. And let me emphasize here that I am in no way likening retirement to rainy days. But the fact is that with just about 10%, yes, just about 10% of the working population enrolled in a retirement scheme or pension plan, the golden years for many of us don't really look so golden. Retirement is that point in all our lives where we stop working, especially because of having reached a particular age or because of ill health. It is highly recommended that you start planning for that eventuality as soon as possible because retirement is a major life change for a majority of us. You'll have to stop working, which means a major stream of your income has halted, and you will then have to rely on your finances and how well you plan them. Financial preparedness is about being able to financial, finance health care expenses, bills, and your employment. Being prepared for your retirement years is important in more ways than one because many things have changed and will continue to change over time. High inflation means a higher cost of living, increasing health-related expenses, increased life expectancy. We are living longer. That means the average Jamaican will live longer in retirement, which means they will continue to have their expenses to take care of. Retirement planning and financial literacy are intertwined. Studies in other jurisdictions have shown that there's a positive relationship between financial literacy and retirement planning. Individuals who are more financially knowledgeable, for instance, those of you who are participating in the Ministry of Finance's Wealth Summit today, those persons understand the time value of money, the diversification of portfolio, etc. And they are more likely to take deliberate action, the earlier the better, to ensure a st stream of income upon retirement. Now, in response, the government and several nonprofit organizations have undertaken incentives to enhance financial literacy through the Financial Services Commission. We are also a member of the Network for Pensions in Latin America and the Caribbean, PLAT Network. And in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank Retirement Saving Scheme, there's funding for the development of innovative mechanisms that encourage voluntary savings for retirement. Now, the FSC also plays a very key role in financial literacy, especially with regards to retirement planning. We participate in town hall sessions, publishing, we publish educational material. The FSC, through its pensions division, regulates and supervises the private pensions industry with the aim of enhancing confidence in retirement planning. Remember, we spoke about that 11% earlier. 
That's 11% of the working population. We need to grow that figure. Otherwise, what will happen is that you or someone you know is going to be a burden on your family, neighbors, the government, somebody, if you don't plan for retirement. The private pension industry consists of formal retirement arrangements established by employers for the employees, which are known as superannuation funds, or investment managers for persons not in a superannuation fund. These are retirement schemes. The FSC assesses governance and, financial and the financial position of the pension plans and their agents, administrators, and investment managers with key focus on what is disclosed to the members and benefit preservation. In other words, we don't want you investing in a scheme today and by tomorrow or when you eventually retire. It has collapsed. It was not financially viable. Current size of the Jamaican pensions industry as at December 31, 2020 was $663 billion. Uh, during 2020, there were about 817 pension plans. Again, that total pension coverage, however, only was about 11.5%. And there were 377 active pension plans. So, in terms of creating wealth, you, we have spoken to you and we have discussed the whole issue of ensuring your assets and we have spoken to you about planning for retirement. But during that journey, you need to create some wealth. And earlier you, you heard the Jamaica Stock Exchange representative, Michael Johnson, speaking about the importance of investing in stocks and shares. And that is critical. At least twice, the stock exchange has been designated the best performing stock exchange globally. The Financial Services Commission regulates the, and monitors the solvency and market conduct of licensed entities through a program of routine and special examinations. Now, amongst the FSC's priorities has been a recently completed project to review and strengthen the framework for issuer registration and prospectus disclosure. Now, the value of the securities industry is approximately $1.92 trillion. Let me repeat that for you. The value of the Jamaican securities industry is approximately $1.92 trillion. Are you a part of that? You should be a part of that because that is how you are going to create wealth. The FSC and the Jamaica Stock Exchange have been partners in several public outreach invest education initiatives for years. We have collaborated on several initiatives, including town hall meetings, seminars and webinars, and even events like the World Investor Week internationally. So investing in the securities market is another way to plan for a rainy day. But I cannot, in closing, overemphasize the importance of checking before you invest. Jamaica has had major disruptions to our economic well-being because of a tendency to take a chance. That is not how you invest and save for a rainy day. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Don't risk your rainy day savings to anyone who is not licensed by the Financial Services Commission. There have been cases of lawyers, pastors, doctors, nurses, teachers, and other professionals offering investment advice when they have no license to do so. It must stop or we run the risk of collapsing our economy. Thank you so much to the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, particularly Shelly Ann Weeks and her team for inviting the Financial Services to be here. And of course, I'm going to ask you that there should be a link online that we will ask you to complete an evaluation uh, survey that we are doing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It has been a pleasure and an honor to be here at the Ministry's Wealth Summit. Thank you so much to Mr. David Geddes. He is the director of 
He's the Director of the Office of Stakeholder Engagement, Communication and International Relations at the Financial Services Commission. I'm sure you, you learned a lot from Mr. Geddes' um, presentation. There is a question, though, coming out of his presentation for my viewers online. That question is, it, what number anniversary is the FSC celebrating this year? All right, so my viewers on MOF, uh, MOF Facebook, MOF YouTube, JIS Facebook, and JIS YouTube, send your questions or rather your answers to the chat, and then I'll announce you as a winner. You know what you get? Right, you get a gift package courtesy of the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. Um, some items that you, you're going to enjoy. So, Mr. Geddes... He told us how to save for a rainy day. We want to ask him a little bit more. We want to pick him brain, you know what I mean? So we're going to invite him. And we're also going to hear from Shelley and Weeks, um, Exec Director of Communications at the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Geddes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Such a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, for I you feel like I'm going to be speaking to some issues that are of central concern. I'm going to tell you. Persons, <laughs> I feel like I'm centrally speaking. So you're fearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not bad at all. <laughs> that's not bad at all. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, so Mr. Geddes, you first. Um, saving for a rainy day. Based on your experience, do Jamaicans save? We, well, we, some persons may save informally, like under their mattress. That still happens. Yes. Or they, you know, they yeah, have uh, um, funds stored away. But what we want to encourage is persons saving in the formal industry and not just saving in a bank account, you know. That, that facilitates different electronic transfers and enhances financial inclusion, which I know is very dear to your heart. Uh, seeing that exactly. the secretary at, um, <laughs> yes, Melanie is that, Williams is that Bank of Jamaica. Secretary yes. at the Bank of Jamaica. And yes. we work very closely with yes. her yes. and the Bank of Jamaica. Of but course. we want persons investing in retirement planning. We want persons investing in insurance and investing in stocks and bonds to create wealth, to protect your assets, and to plan for retirement. Very critical. All right, great. So um, you just mentioned that you work closely um, with BOJ through, through the Technical Secretariat for Financial Inclusion. So it means then that you are oftentimes engaged in forums just like this that promote financial literacy. Um, from your perspective, what is a salient point of financial literacy? So when we say to persons, you must be financially literate, what do we mean? Well, let's take it from our school's financial education mm -hmm. program. We have different models in that. One of the key things is um, planning to earn and creating a budget. That's a very basic essence of financial literacy, that you must plan to earn and that you must also plan how you're going to spend your funds. Mm -hmm. That's budgeting. Yes. And if you understand that and the need to plan for the future, to create wealth, to insure your assets, you get a motor car or you get a home or furnishings in a house, whatever. Once you get any asset, you must insure them. And of course, again, you know, you must create wealth and that you do by investing in different stocks and bonds. All uh, right. All right. That, there you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was David Geddes. He's the director for the Office of Stakeholder Engagement at the Financial Services Commission. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank, Geddes. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I, I must thank the Minister of Finance yes. and the Public Service yes. again. Because this is a really timely event and yes. it is really beneficial. And I hope a lot of persons are participating and I look forward I to so the too. next event. I hope so too, right. At I which I will be a participant. <laughs> <laughs> Not a presenter this time. Yes. I don't think Shelley will make you, make you get with that one. <laughs> All right. Um, but thank you again, uh, Mr. Geddes. It was great having you and for you to share your knowledge. All Thank right. Thank you so much. Alan. All right. From David Geddes, we we speak now to we we reintroduce ourselves to Shelley and Weeks, Director of Communications. Shago communicated me now. Mm -hmm. Let me just. <laughs> I wonder if this mic is working. <laughs> oh this <gosh>. feel deep. <laughs> uh, so so Shelley. All right. So our, the this this summit is is supported 
or, or supports, actually, the government's national financial inclusion strategy. It is just one of the outcomes mm -hmm. for financial, ensuring that there is financial literacy, right. the promulgation of financial literacy. All right, from the ministry's perspective, um, from your, and this would be from the policy side, right? Um, what is the ministry doing or going to do apart from Wealth Summit, to ensure that we achieve uh, a financially literate um, society. I mean, we know that the ministry works closely with Bank of Jamaica that has the technical secretariat for the fin National Financial Inclusion um, Program. But of course, it's, it works with the, the partners, which includes, of course, the, the FSC, the NHT, and uh, the, the ministry. So from the ministry's perspective, how do we ensure that the citizens of Jamaica become more financially literate. You asked me about policy, and I'm <laughs> going to leave the policy to the persons who deal with policy. But what I will say yes. is from a communication standpoint, the ministry is very invested in ensuring that our language and our information that we disseminate to the public is easily digestible by the end user. And it is very important for us to be clear and to ensure that the things that benefit Jamaicans, they not only know about it, but they have access to it, and they can actually use it in order to improve their lives. So from, from the standpoint of um, communication, which is why an, an event such as this was born, is that we don't just want to know that, all right, a lot of the times different funds will come out, or there's a grant available, or mm -hmm. there might be some opportunity for our SME to have access to, to, to resources that can help their, build, their, their businesses develop, but they don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Or even if they do know about it, they see it and they go, sure, would I never qualify for something like that? And mm -hmm. they leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's simple ignorance. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand what it takes. They just don't know what the next, step, the next steps are. And they just don't know how these different things, how a grant, for example, differs from a loan. Mm -hmm. how, how is it that when you hear... Um, uh, there might be a, a, a fund of X amount of U.S. dollars available to enhance small businesses. If you're a small business, what does that really translate to? What does that really mean? So we want to translate that for you. So you hear about this fund, we want you to, to look at it and to go, okay, so this is where I apply. This is how I can get access to the money. And since it's a grant, I don't have to pay it back. And so this fund can be used to help my business get to the next step and so on. So it's very important for us, for the information to be accessible and understandable for regular Jamaicans to benefit from it. All right, great, well said. Shelly, me like your glasses, can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but I said tell you that before I ask you the next question. Well, I can't tell you, say, um, it is a running joke right now amongst my friends that I'm getting blind slowly, but I'm doing it fashionably, you know? Fashionably. Yes, fashionably. man, I can, I'm, you know, I like the frames, uh, it's but a communicate. trust me, I really do need help to see. It's a communicate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you made a you made a very important point about the information that people um, people don't know. All right, um, for lack of knowledge, yeah, yes. we perish. Yeah, uh, what are some of the major policy developments um, in recent times that that are helping, are going to help, that are intended to help individuals, businesses, especially? Micro, micro, the SMS, the MSME, I always fumble on that, <laughs> the MSME sector. So what, what in recent times are those policy decisions that, that are intended to develop um, individual wealth or enable individual wealth and the development of the MSME um, sector? And I keep asking me about policy. I don't <laughs> want to get myself in trouble, you know, because there are some things that are above my pay grade. But what I will say yes. is I'm happy that we, we have the participation and the zeal from Mr. Geddes because his institution is really doing a lot to ensure that the education is dealt with mm -hmm. and as well the support is there to ensure that Jamaicans, whenever they invest in themselves financially, that their money is protected and they can actually get the best out of their buck. Because that is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. What is it that you can do when you make this money to get more out of it? Mm -hmm. And there are a myriad... I mean, I sat here today. I, must, I became a full-on student today because, <laughs> you know, some of the presenters got very personal in my business <laughs> and they were talking about some of the bad habits that <laughs> I have. 
have <laughs> drape, <up>. drape me <laughs> up wickedly, talking about my payday lunches. Yes. <laughs> which, by the way, some of the people who I used to go payday lunch with oh, no, no, have no more sushi to forget. <laughs> I'm just saying that. Oh, but, God, but, but, but I became such a student today because yes. there was so much I realized I did not know. Mm -hmm. And even in putting this event together, I knew that this would be useful to a lot of persons. And it became even useful to me mm -hmm. because um, stocks, I'm going to get my little $10,000 mm -hmm. and I will be calling Mr. Johnson to mm -hmm. see what I can make my $10,000 do. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of persons look at stocks and they think, oh, this is a rich people something. We yes. need to have at least a hundred pack yes. before I can even call the stock market. You know what I mean? Yes. So I think that starting here is very important. And as we get into the ingredients that we put into policy decisions, it is important to get this sort of feedback, especially from the public, because it, 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 it is important that our policies work to benefit mm -hmm. our people, because that is the purpose of the whole exercise. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Before I put you on the spot, on let, the me spot say, like <laughs> let me say a very good afternoon to Minister Nigel Clark, Minister of the uh, Finance and the Public Service. May I also say good afternoon to Ms. Marsha Smith, State Minister. And good afternoon to Darlene Morrison, uh, Financial Secretary. Oh, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the... The, the wrong audience. <laughs> this <laughs> is the right audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Minister Nigel Clark, good afternoon to you. My name is Anna. I want to talk to you. <laughs> um, uh, Marsha Smith, State Minister, good afternoon. Darlene Morrison, Financial Secretary, good afternoon. Uh, the question I have for Shelley, what is really for you, Threena, because you represent the leadership of the ministry, is, and we got this out of, got this out of, um, Acadia's presentation, Acadia Francis, she says that the, 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 the environment is not here yet to support a fully digital society, meaning that our laws are not yet up to par. I, the term that I, I think I coined was that our legislation doesn't match our digital ambition. So representing the leadership of the ministry, please may I beg on a do. Whatever it takes just to bring those laws up to par with our ambitions, right? So coming out of today's summit, there are concerns that the, the banking sector, the, the payments architecture, I think some of that um, BOJ is, um, is involved in, the banking sector, the legislation and the payments architecture are not yet fully supportive of a digital society. So we want to get those up as quickly as possible. So... Shelly, I kind of giving you a message. Like when you know them directly. <laughs> they got it. They got the message. Like when you know them. Yes. Like when you know them directly. Please. So one of the key takeaways from this today's summit is just to ensure that the environment is there. There's a lot of progress that is being made, policy on the other side. But legislatively, the banking sector, you know, hurry up that part there for me a little bit. Thank you so much, Shelley. And I uh, thank you. All Ms. right, Anna. as we get ready for the next presenter, Dr. Jade Lewis at Bank of Jamaica. Before we get to him, Before we get to Dr. Lewis, I did ask a question. That question was, what number anniversary is the FSC celebrating this year? Um, did anyone win that, provide the correct answer to that question? My social media coordinator will get me that response. So, you know, um, while she comes, I remind you of today's word, the word of the day. PESIB, P-E-S-S-I-B. Right, it means the components of financial literacy. So this is what is involved in a financial. This is what a financial lit, financially literate person understands. They understand how to protect their money. That's P. They understand how to earn more money, multiple streams of income. They understand how to save, stop those leaks. They understand. They understand how to spend, spending wisely. And they sh this is the next letter, I. 
they understand how to invest. If you were listening closely to Michael Johnson's presentation, you'd have had some very key insights in how to invest in the stock market. All right, so after Dr. Lewis's presentation, I'll tell you the final component of financial literacy. All right, introducing Dr. Jade Lewis. Uh, he's... His career at Bank of Jamaica started in 2004, where he served as an economist, senior economist in the Financial Stability Department. And he also served as a director, on the board of directors rather, for the Statistical Institute of Jamaica. He is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, from which he holds a PhD in economic development policy development in 2008. He was accredited as a certified financial analyst and was certified as a financial risk manager in 2005. He graduated from the University of York with an MSc in economics and finance. Dr. Jade Lewis, please welcome the chief prudential officer at Bank of Jamaica. He'll talk to us about credit management and consolidating your loans and repairing your credit. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jade Lewis. Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you so much for joining uh, for this particular presentation or um, staying online for this particular presentation. So as uh, would have been mentioned, I'll be presenting on credit management, but credit management in terms of your own personal um, credit management and credit repair. Before I start, I must give this disclaimer that the views expressed in this presentation are my own and are, do not necessarily reflect the views of the Bank of Jamaica. So in terms of an overview of the presentation, I will be touching on a, a couple of topics. One is wealth and personal credit management, the relationship between those two things. The second is the credit reporting ecosystem that exists in Jamaica and how that impacts you. The third is personal credit risk management tips, and then I will talk briefly about credit repair. So from a credit management perspective, you could define wealth as being having an abundance of valuable possessions, money, and assets. But that is not the perspective I want to take this afternoon. I want to talk about wealth in the context of um, one's assets and one's liabilities. Essentially, wealth is having more assets than your liabilities. Why? Because if you have more assets than your liabilities, the income from your assets are going to be, over time, exceeding the expenses that you have from day to day. And that means, over time, you can grow your assets. Um, so... The presentation is from the perspective of how do you maximize your net asset value. And to do so, it means that you have to manage your liabilities well. Um, if you go to the slide that speaks to, that looks at an, an individual's balance sheet, um, you will see that you may think of your, an individual as having Wonderful. You may, th you may think of a balance sheet as being something that, that is the domain of a financial institution, a business, a government. But you as an individual, you also have a balance sheet. That balance sheet has assets and it has liabilities. On the asset side, you could have cash and some of that cash could be at a bank, for example. You could have investments, uh, maybe in government securities, maybe you have investments in a corporation. Maybe you have some stocks, and I heard the early the previous presentation talking about that. Uh, you may have assets like a car, fixed assets like a house, and that's on the asset side. On the liability side of your balance sheet, you could have money that you have borrowed from friends. You could have funds that you have borrowed from a financial institution, a mortgage, a bank loan, credit card debt, etc. And what you really want to do is look at whether or not, when you write down all the things you own, and all the things you owe for, whether or not the dollar value of the difference between those two things is positive. If you have more assets than you have liabilities, then you, are, you have a positive net wealth position. And the question is, how do you grow it? So, how do we manage the liability side of our balance sheet? That's what I want to focus on this afternoon and give you some tips. 
And in that context, I want to talk about the role that credit bureaus play. Credit bureaus collect information on your borrowing behavior over your life cycle. And they provide this information with your consent to financial institutions that ask for that credit report. Now, in the regime, you also have credit information providers. And in Jamaica, um, you have banks that provide credit information. You have um, um, credit unions. You have um, financial houses. You have higher purchase companies that provide lending as a part of their business, not as a core part, but as a part of their business. And as they do this lending, they share that lending activity with a credit bureau. Then there is you, the, co the consumer. You can request um, loan facilities from a financial institution, or you could go to a company and say you want to, for example, purchase a bed or, or a sofa, but you want credit terms in order to access it. Um, o over time or pay for it over time. And then, of course, they are the lenders. So this is the ecosystem that exists in Jamaica. It's the, what we call the credit reporting ecosystem. It consists of you, the, the, the potential borrower. It consists of lenders, th those may be financial institutions, banks, credit unions, um, um, higher purchase companies, micro lending agencies. It consists of those lenders contribute information to credit bureaus. And they are called, when they, when they contribute their information, their lending information to credit bureaus, they are categorized as credit information providers. And they are legally authorized so to do. What they cannot do is they cannot access the information that is at a credit bureau without your consent. And then finally, just wanted to mention that BOJ we supervise the credit information providers and the, the credit bureaus um, under the Credit Reporting Act. This is just some general information about our, the credit bureaus that are licensed in Jamaica and the coverage right now in terms of credit information, about 48% of the adult population between 16 and 64 are covered in their information is covered or contained within one of the credit bureaus. So we have quite an extensive um, activity in terms of credit information sharing in Jamaica. I mentioned this before, so I won't spend too much time, but this under the act, um, you are allowed, the credit bureau may disclose information um, in particular instances. One is they may disclose that information to a potential lender with your written permission. They also disclose information if it's requested by the Bank of Jamaica. Um, if there is a court order, they could request the information. And also to you, the customer, you can request your own information. And this is very important. I may not get the time to say it, so I'll say it now. As a, a Jamaican who is involved in financial activity, each year you have the right to access your credit report from one of the credit bureaus in Jamaica for free. So I'm going to say that again. Each year, every Jamaican has the right to request their credit report from one of the licensed credit bureaus um, that operate in Jamaica. And that is very important from a credit management perspective because you want to know what information is, um, is being captured about your borrowing behavior over time. What you do not want to happen is that you go to a financial institution and you want to take out a loan, and when you take out the loan, you hear that, and you give your consent to, to access the credit report. You don't want at that point to be surprised that there's erroneous information about your borrowing history. And so it's good to get that report, look through it, see if it's accurate. If it's not accurate, I'll talk a little bit about what you can do. So what is that credit report? It contains the total amount of borrowings that you have done over maybe the last five, ten years. Um, it talks about your loan balances for outstanding loans, and it gives an idea as to whether or not you have been making good on your obligations. Therefore, are you paying your loan obligations on time? And are you paying your loan obligations in full? Both are important. If you pay on time, but you don't pay the full amount, it's still 
not 100%. Um, if you pay um, late, but you pay in full, then it's still um, going to be problematic. So you want to be able to pay on time and in full, um, fulfilling all your contractual obligations under your lending or your borrowing arrangements. So what is personal credit management? It's a process by which individuals build a set of principles to guide how they will effectively and consistently meet their debt obligations and build a strong credit reputation. Why is a strong credit reputation important? A strong reputa credit reputation is important because borrow lenders, when they're looking to make a, a decision to lend to you, they're going to say, if you were a good credit in the past, you're likely to be a good credit in the future. So as you build what I call your, your credit collateral, after a while it becomes easier and easier, not just to access credit, but also it becomes easier to negotiate for better, better borrowing terms, meaning you can um, negotiate for lower interest rates, you can negotiate for a longer repayment period, or you can even negotiate for um, um, lending facilities that match your cash inflows. And that is extremely important. So I'm going to pause. When you're entering into a borrowing relationship with a financial institution or any um, um, co um, other legal entity, it's important that you stop and you think, based on this contract and when I'm expected to pay, will it match my cash inflows? Therefore, if you know, for example, you get paid on the, at the end of the month, it's important that your obligations are not going to be due before that time. Because that means that you're going to be paying in full, but you're going to be paying late. And that is going to be problematic over time. So, now that we've discussed what good personal credit risk management is, um, let's talk about some of the things you can do to manage your, that liability side of your balance sheet. That's the side that you have your credit card, you have your bank loan, you have the coach that you got on higher purchase, you have your car loan, you have your mortgage, that side of your balance sheet. What are things that you can do to be able to manage it over time? One is to prepare a budget, and I'm sure this has been said earlier, um, um, so forgive me if it has been said, but it just shows how important it is. Um, you know, do you have a budget that outlines what all your expenses are going to be for the month and what all your income or receipts um, from your business activities are going to be for the month? The next thing is you can set up monthly standing orders or salary deductions that can go to specific accounts so you never see it. If you know, for example, at the end of each month you have a mortgage and that mortgage is $25,000, and I know this is a fictitious number, you can set up a standing order for that, those funds to be deducted from your salary at that specific period and transferred to that financial institution. What that means is that you don't run the risk ever of spending out of that money and then needing to figure out where you're going to find that extra cash to pay your mortgage. Um, the other thing you can do from time to time is do that inventory of your assets and liabilities. And when you do that inventory of your assets and liabilities, and I would say do it every half a year or so, is that you can see, am I, are my liabilities um, reasonable? Am I, do I have too much debt for my income? Um, is it my interest that I'm spending to service these um, debt obligations, be it the bank loan for the car, the mortgage? Is there a way that I can re restructure those so that I can have lower interest expenses? And then, of course, on the asset side, you could do the same. Am I, is my asset mix the right sort of asset mix in terms of stocks, bonds, et cetera, et cetera? But do that inventory of your assets and your liabilities. And then, of course, once you have done that, then you can look at ways to maximize your assets, which is your investment income, and minimize your liabilities, which is your interest expense, or your, your, your essentially um, the, the, the funds that you're, you're spending to meet your, your obligations. What else is involved? You can also make um, a plan when you're going to borrow to um, buy a fixed asset. Make sure that fixed asset retains its value over time. What that means is that if, if, if the asset that you have retains its value 
and let us say you have a loan for five years and in year three you have a change in life circumstances you lose your job what that means is that you can make a tactical decision it may be a difficult decision but you could make a decision to liquidate that asset sell it get as much money as you can for that asset pay down your your liability and then start over again it is much better to be proactive and make that very difficult decision than for you to wait um, not pay your loan obligation, then have the financial institution or the higher purchase company come to seize the collateral. Because then you neither have the asset or the benefit of the asset, nor do you have, and, and now you, you don't have the benefit of having those funds to liquidate that liability anymore on your terms. So what else do we have? You could ensure that you do not spend more than you can pay back in full, for example, when your credit card becomes due. It's extremely important that you do not make your decisions around your credit card limit. If your credit card limit is $500,000, it doesn't mean you spend $500,000. It means that you check to see how much is income am I expecting over the next month. And if it is $300,000, then you don't let your credit card go above $300,000. So your credit card limit is not the ceiling of what you're, you're planning to spend. Your limit is on the basis of your budget. Finally, plan to invest and save, um, especially when you have lump sums or windfalls. For example, you may get back pay. I know several persons on this uh, webinar are um, from the Ministry of Finance. Um, if you get back pay, it's a great time to t take those funds and sit down and figure out not just what can I invest in, but do I have high interest-bearing debt um, loans that I can pay down and um, settle those obligations? That's also a wise thing to do. So um, I'm going to wrap up now. I'm going to say it's going to be extremely important to avoid making late payments on your debt obligations because if you do that, that becomes um, embedded in your credit report. And when you go for a loan facility, that can act against you because the, the, the loan provider or the financial institution will say or could say to themselves, well, if this person is not um, you know, careful to pay back their existing debt, why should I be expose myself to the risk of giving them more debt with the chance that they will not pay, make good on those obligations? Um, you want to prevent unintended defaults, meaning you want to make sure that you always have a calendar of when you should pay. For me personally, I usually have a little reminder on my phone that says, remember to pay credit card bill, remember to pay rent, um, notice to yourself, remember to renegotiate, so on and so. So little reminders. Um, try to maintain an excellent um, credit score, which basically means try to make sure that you always pay in full and on time. Um, and then negotiate, 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 negotiate. We in Jamaica, we have a market-based economy for our financial system. And that means it's based on demand and supply. You as a borrower, you are part of the demand for loans. The banks are part of the supply of loans. And therefore, you have to be able to figure out how to manage your demand. And you can only do that if you have good information. So if you go to one bank, let's say Bank A, and they say they can give you a loan at 10%, and you know you have a good credit report, you know you pay all your loans on time and in full, you can take that information because you would have accessed it from your credit bureau for free, as I mentioned earlier, so you know what information the credit bureaus have on you. It's not private. It's, it's, it's not private to you. It's, it's, it, well, maybe I should say it's only private to you, and you can share it with others with your consent. Um, but you know that information. So therefore, I'm going to ask that you use that information to go around, shop around, and see where are the best interest rates, where are the best deals for loans. Don't just go to one place and hear what they have to say and then sign the contract. Do your research and come up with something that is right for you. I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to um, you know, probably open the floor and invite questions.
Lewis, Chief Credential Officer at Bank of Jamaica, giving us some insight into how we can manage our credit. Dr. Lewis, would you like to would you like to join me so I can feel those questions that you invited? <laughs> Uh, if you're just joining us, you missed one of the very interesting presentations on credit management. Dr. Lewis spoke about the credit bureau system that has, this is relatively, is relatively new in Jamaica. Um, he said that 48% of the adult population, their credit history is recorded among the approved or the licensed credit bureaus. We're going to talk to Dr. Lewis a little bit more about how to manage our credit. Following, following um, our interview with Dr. Lewis, then we move to a panel discussion, all right? All six presenters will rejoin us uh, where we get to get from some further insights into their presentations and we'll also take some, some questions from you, our audience. There's Kadia Francis from Digital Jamaica, Michael Johnson, Jamaica Stock Exchange, and Melissa Golden, Law Insurance Broker, Sheldon Christian from First Heritage, David Geddes from the FSC, and of course, Dr. Jade Lewis, who we speak with now. Dr. Lewis. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Good to see you again. Same here. <laughs> Two of them don't know, so we come from far. Boy, I think <laughs> it's a lot of history. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of history. All right, so, Dr. Lewis, um, credit management mm -hmm. and credit repair. Uh, two concepts that are becoming familiar to the Jamaican, um, to the average Jamaican. The fact that our credit history is, um, is now recorded and is accessible by financial institutions. Now, this is a wealth summit designed to, to provide information on creating wealth. How can one use their credit, their credit history, credit as an asset um, in creating wealth? All right, that's a very, very good question. Um, and what I would say is that uh, the, you have to think about your wealth as being the management, not just of your assets, mm -hmm. but also of your liabilities. Mm -hmm. So the perspective that I had in the presentation mm -hmm. was to say, how do you manage those liabilities that you have? Because if you don't, what happens over time is that they grow faster than your assets. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, you become bankrupt. Yes. So a lot of times we're focusing on one side of the discussion, which is how do I invest my funds, which right. is the asset side mm -hmm. of, of your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be careful to say, well, am I managing my debt obligations well? And mm -hmm. that is where credit bureaus come in. Right. Because credit bureaus allow you to leverage the fact that you um, um, have borrowing relationships with other financial institutions. Mm -hmm. You pay your debts on time. You mm -hmm. pay in full. And therefore, you can use that information to bargain when you go to a financial house, when you go to um, a higher purchase company, when you go to a micro lending agency, you can say, hey, I will give you consent to access my credit report because that will give you information as to how to price my loan and give me terms which I am comfortable with. All right, so in a, in a real way, um, when we are taking on additional liabilities, if we maintain good credit, we, can be, we are in a position to negotiate what I would call preferential interest rates, right? Yes. Right, so... Before I ask you my next question, is it that we have a scoring system in Jamaica similar to that in the U.S., where we know we are, or we know our score, the financial um, institution knows our score, and then assesses our risk accordingly? All right. So the credit reporting regime in Jamaica was inaugurated in about 2010. Yes. And we had our first licensee in 2013. So it's still a fairly young industry. Yeah. Some of the credit bureaus have started coming up with credit scores. Mm -hmm. And what credit scores are essentially is that they look at your credit information and they come up with an assessment, a number that tells how good a credit you are. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, in America, for example, they have what is called a FICO score. Mm -hmm. Some of our credit bureaus have started to, you, to do that. But most um, financial institutions actually just ask for the printout of your credit report. I see. And they just read through it. Right. Because there's no hard and fast rule about mm -hmm. how to use a credit report. Mm -hmm. They look, they, they, they make an, a judgment around whether or not they are comfortable lending to you, mm -hmm. and then they make a judgment around what interest rate to offer you and for how long they want to extend credit and how much credit they want to extend to you. Okay, I see. So um, 
there are not all licensed um, credit bureaus um, operate on a scoring system. Yeah. But the banks use the full report to make a decision. Now, so the, the context of your presentation or the perspective was that we should manage our liabilities even more than we manage our assets. Yeah, because if, they, if we have too many liabilities, then we become bankrupt. Right, so, so my next question is, how do, we, how do we from month to month manage that liability? Um, apart from paying our, paying our expenses on time, ap apart from paying them in full, how else can we deliberately manage our liabilities? It's a very, mm -hmm. um, very um, intuitive question. And I mean, basically, essentially, you want to make sure Sorry about that. Sure. Basically, you want to make sure that you look at your interest expense. Okay. And you ask yourself, am I paying too much for my liabilities? All right, good. If you find that your interest expense is growing over time and it is dwarfing your income, mm -hmm. then it's time to look at debt consolidation. Mm -hmm. And debt consolidation is where you would put a set of your, your liabilities together. You go to a financial institution and you say, can I refinance these obligations? Mm -hmm. And some financial institutions, they may be able to say to you, yes, we can put all of these together. Essentially, what they'll do, they'll issue a new loan mm -hmm. that would allow you to extinguish that existing obligation, and they will give you, allow you to pay back that new loan at a lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you were paying interest rate for every month of $15,000, you may be able to consolidate all your debt and pay an interest rate of $10,000. Mm -hmm. That $5,000 worth of savings, if you put that in your asset side and invest, yes. then you grow your wealth. As to the math. And so that, that's the math. As to the math. That's the math. As to the math. So a lot of persons, they don't look at how much they're spending to, to service their loan obligations. And yes. I'm suggesting that persons do that every six months. Okay. Do an inventory. How much, what are all my assets? What are all my liabilities? What am I earning from all my assets? And what am I earning from all my liabilities? And then you can make, start to make um, serious wealth management decisions. All right. You heard it from the doctor, ladies and gentlemen. Him say, this is what him prescribe. <clears throat> Consolidate debt if your interest payments are eating away at your assets. All right, consolidate those debts and manage your credit in such a way that you don't become bankrupt because it's easy to do that. <clears throat> Dr. Jade Lewis, thank you so much. All right, you're going to stay with us for the, for the panel discussion. Absolutely, <clears throat> I look what, forward to it. Thank you. While I invite um, our other presenters um, to join us, Katie Francis from Digital Jamaica, Michael Johnson from the Jamaica Stock Exchange, Melissa Golden from Law Insurance Brokers, Sheldon Christian, First Heritage, David Geddes, Financial Services Commission, and of course, Jide Lewis from Bank of Jamaica. We're going to talk to all these presenters about financial literacy. We're going to take your questions. And speaking about question, let me, let me ask one question, don't it? I asked, I asked what, what anniversary, what number anniversary is the FSC celebrating this year? And I understand that we have a winner in Sean Murray. He's he is joining us from the MOF's YouTube stream. He's joining us from the MOF YouTube stream. He got that answer correct. Sean, you win for yourself a gift package from the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. You'll be contacted on how to claim your gift. Are we ready for that panel discussion with our presenters? Um, let us first welcome...
Good afternoon. Welcome back to the final segment of the Ministry at of Finance and the Public Services Inaugural Wealth Summit. I am your host from your city, from your city face, and hear the voice. You know it's me, Anna Smith. Yo, so we are broadcasting live from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. We're streaming to the Ministry of Finance's Facebook page, YouTube channel, from JIS's Facebook page and YouTube channel. The theme, investing in Jamaica's, the theme of this, um, this month's summit is making every cent count. Heard that? Now, so if you've been joining me, if you've been, you've been with me from the start of the summit, I gave you some gave you some instructions. You must have your iPad and your upper pencil. You must have your notepad or your HB pencil. Anything works. And you should be making notes, all right, from, from the presenters. We started today with Kadia Francis of Digital Jamaica. Then Michael Johnson, Stock Exchange, putting your money to work. Melissa Golden from the Law Insurance Brokers, getting the best bang for your budget. Sheldon Christian from First Heritage, he sits right beside me. Uh, make bargains that make a difference. David Geddes, the Financial Services Commission, uh, talking about saving for a rainy day, and Dr. Jade Lewis at Bank of Jamaica on credit management. All right, so it's been quite an informative summit um, being hosted by the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. By the way, if you feel good about it, you can tag them, you know, and post. All right, if you want to follow MOF on Instagram and on Twitter, their handle is at MOF Jamaica, the Facebook page, Ministry of Finance. And if you want to hashtag, because, you know, make we think trending also, then you use the hashtags Wealth Summit 2021, hashtag Wealth Summit, or hashtag Investing in Jamaicans. Today's, today's summit is about financial literacy, making you financially literate. One of the key outcomes of financial literacy is confidence. When you know, you know. And when you know, you make the best decisions for you and your family. So the objective of financial literacy is subsumed under a, under a, wider, a wider plan, and that is the, the National Financial Inclusion Strategy. So financial inclusion is, a, is, a, is an approach by the government to ensure that Jamaican citizens have access to the financial products and services that meet their needs. And in order to have access, you need to know about it, hence financial literacy. Our panel of presenters today gave us varying perspectives from varying um, sectors of, of, um, of finance on how to create wealth, because after all, it is a wealthy summit. Uh, they joined me again for a panel discussion. I already have some questions, but allow me to introduce them to you again, just in case you are joining us from my immediate, or from my utmost, I would say this again, I want to say there. A far left. <laughs> but now I left you out. Now I left you out. Katie Francis um, from Digital Jamaica. Uh, we learned from her how we can earn, uh, earn with our digital brand. Then there is Michael Johnson from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Me want to talk to him personally no, after, after we finish. Um, then right beside me is the golden one, Melissa Golden. She dripped me up, but you know. To drip me up, but not lying. So I'm gonna close the crush up, drip me up, throw a word for me. So we don't pay bills on time and them something there. All right. But she, of course, gives us guidance on how to get the best bang of, from our budget. Right beside me is the Calabar old boy. I'm a case you old girl, you understand? But I like you still, you know what I mean? You're all right. <laughs> You're all right, okay? Uh, this is Sheldon Christian, a branch manager of the year, Spanish Town branch, First Heritage Cooperative Credit Union. Beside him is David Geddes, not Dennis and Geddes, David Geddes, all right? He's from the FSC, and he is going to tell us about saving for a rainy day. <laughs> No, 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 seriously, no, no, seriously, but hey, but viewers, you know, some Monroe and Teachfield is country school, right? Right? Casey and Calabar, but thing, yes. All right, and and then, and then, um, last but no means least, Dr. Jade Lewis from Bank of Jamaica, who spoke to us on credit management. So they're going to be answering some of your questions 
and some of mine, and they're going to be sharing with you their perspectives on creating wealth, all right, for you to become financially literate. Welcome again, panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. Can I thank you on behalf of the ministry for your time? All right, so we have some questions from YouTube. Based on the questions, I'm going to pose them to different persons. And the first question um, is from Shazi Savi, oh, Shazi Savi Vlogs. I hope I got that right. And that's a YouTube question. I think I'm going to pose this to Mr. Geddes. All right. Do you think a partner is a good equivalent to savings? Well, I'm going to have to answer that very carefully, given... <laughs> given the popularity of partners in <laughs> Jamaica. Yes. Well, let me, let me answer it this way. In terms of saving and investment, you don't get an interest when you put your money in a partner. In fact, you get less out of it because the banker usually holds a hand out of it in a lot of partners. So it, it is a good way of mandatory saving, but you lose on it. If, if you are looking at investing and actually getting a return, I wouldn't recommend uh, partners. I think that there are many more avenues of investment that you can utilize to get a good return on your, on your funds. All right. So that was from David Geddes. So in a, in a, in a sense, um, saving is good. And the partner plan is good. But of course, it has its disadvantages. Your, your money um, is better utilized um, in an investment um, in an investment if, facility, yeah. If I could also <coughs> just emphasize, even yes. though, even though um, the FSC is not really involved in the deposit-taking right. sector, we're in the non-deposit-taking sector, insurance companies, securities, private pension. But I, I would be remiss of me not to mention, uh, given that the JDIC is not here, is that when you put your money in a licensed financial institution, a commercial bank, etc., you those savings are insured mm -hmm. at no cost to you. So, I mean, there's also that to take into account. Okay. All right. Thanks for that additional information. The next question is also from YouTube. <clears throat> I think this is Kelly Styles. When will this process go fully digital? <clears throat> this is a question for you, uh, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Kelly said for you, you know. <laughs> when will this process go fully digital where I can check my email for my annual report or letters showing dividends? have been paid? Currently, our website provides information as it relates to um, dividend payment for our listed companies. Um, it is the registrar of that particular listed company that manages the, cost, uh, the, the shareholders. And therefore, we recommend for persons to speak to their registrar as it relates to that. However, as it relates to accessing historical information and in terms of dividend, that is available on our website and persons can access that. As I said, we have also um, have our mobile app which allows persons to access information, historical information on um, any of the JSE information that they need. So it is there digitally in terms of our mobile app, um, but it is up to the registrar in for providing that specific information for each listed company. All right. So um, what, what would have been the, the disconnect where this user is not getting these um, emails, notification for the annual report and the letter showing her dis dividends? What could have caused that disconnect? Again, it is, it is, it is a registrar that manages the portfolio of any listed company. <coughs> and they are responsible for providing shareholder information for each listed company. So it depends on the registrar um, that manages that aspect of, of it. The stock exchange has a registrar, which is the leading registrar, but we are not the registrar for all the listed companies. All right. I hope that answers your question, uh, Kelly. So, so, so let me just add that. <laughs> it's important for that person to know who the registrar is for that particular company that they are a shareholder. All right. Um, Venice Crawford Marshall. Thank you for that, um, Michael. Venice Crawford Marshall on Facebook. <clears throat> this question is for my friend here from Rabalak. Can you transfer the FIP from one credit union to another? Yes. Good afternoon again. Yes, of course you can. You 
easily. You can transfer the FIP from any credit union. So, of course, the credit union of choice, First Heritage Credit Union. I'm <laughs> 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 telling you about the first time he started out, say that is why he is the manager, branch manager of the year. So, we have another question from Priestnell Warren. Um, Priestnell is sending his, his question from YouTube. And this one is for Dr. Lewis. All right. What is the BOJ doing to hold both credit bureaus and financial institutions accountable um, regarding erroneous credit reports? Mm, no one has sound serious. All right. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's a very good question. And I think it has to, we have to start by um, understanding we'll what the on. right of the consumer um, is under the Credit Reporting Act. So if you <coughs> do get your credit report and you... Um, see that there are errors in that credit report, you have the right to file a complaint to that credit bureau um, and indicate the nature of the error. You can provide the evidence um, to, to substantiate your position, and that credit bureau is obligated to conduct an investigation um, on that error with the credit information provider. Um, they have a stipulated of 14 days to get back to you with their findings. And if, in fact, it, it turns out that the, the error is on the part of either the credit bureau or the CIP that provided the information, the credit bureau must make the amendment to the credit report, and they must advise um, all the persons that would have requested credit reports um, under your consent of the change um, to your credit report. So there is a mechanism. If, if you are still not satisfied with the investigation that mm -hmm. is done by the credit bureau, you can write to the Bank of Jamaica um, indicating um, that you are still dissatisfied with the process and the, we would conduct our own um, investigation into the matter. And still, if you are dissatisfied, um, you can um, raise it to uh, an appeals board, an appeals committee, uh, to review the matter. So there are several chains and steps that, that are there uh, as safeguards. But I think to begin the process, and it's why I made mention of it, is that uh, we can all be proactive by requesting our credit reports um, from the credit bureaus that are licensed in Jamaica on, on an annual basis. That report will be provided for free. And you can go through and make sure that there is no information on it. Um, that is erroneous, and you can then um, engage a process that would have, uh, have just outlined. Okay, thanks for that, um, Dr. Lewis. But just in case there's somebody watching who has a current um, issue with a credit bureau, um, can you tell us immediately or um, tell us how to find the email address that we can send that, um, that query to? I would send that, that query to customer complaints at BOJ dot org dot jm so yeah. that's customer complaints at boj dot org dot jm all right and we would pick up that complaint and uh, we would address it okay great i hope that answers your question sufficiently Priestnell, thank you for sending that in all right so our next question i think this is also for you dr lewis based on the the, the point at which point will, be, will we be able to start negotiating rates of interest? And I suspect Andre Parker on YouTube is asking this um, with respect to favorable credit reports. I would like to put it, put it in a context that I think should be familiar with all of us. Um, when it's Saturday morning and we go to the market and we go around the various stalls and we see a piece of yam and the person gives us a price. I don't think any of us just grabs the piece of yam, puts it in our bag, and walks out. We walk around. We look at the piece of yam from <coughs> another place. We make a discussion about the fact that I don't have nothing smaller than a $1,000 bill. And, you know, if you could have given me two plus on top of that, give me a potato and so on. There's no rule about there's no manual that is given to tell us how to do that. So as Jamaicans, we need to take that same approach when we go into a financial institution. Not because the person have a jacket and tie on, mean that you can't tell the person your position and you can't say, here's the facts that I have. I went down the road and I, I, here's an offer that was made to me. 
Here's the consent form for my credit report. Have a look at it. I've been paying my debts on time. I've been paying them in full since I was my, my eyes were at my knees or so and so. You understand me? And make the argument. And you, if, you, if you don't, a transaction is not closed until you accept. So if you don't sign the loan contract, it's not consummated. So hold those offers and do your research. <laughs> ask around. Um, and then weigh the costs and benefits of going with various providers of loan facilities. So when will it start? It will start when we as Jamaicans um, become more active in relation to negotiating our, what we want. What terms do you want? What period do you want to pay over? And so on. Um, inform yourself. Yeah, right. I think that was well said by, by Dr. Lewis. So in, in summary, um, that was for Andre. Uh, use the curry principle. If you ever go coronation market, a beer haggling go on. You know what I mean? Me don't know about Jide and the, and the coronation. I don't see him down there at all. <laughs> I don't see him down there. I mean, how much, how, how, how much a pound there. for that yam? I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> me, 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 me don't see that pound Jide. So, <laughs> yeah, him can't fool me. Um, how much is your, how much a tomato? <laughs> me don't see that pound Jide. <laughs> you want to see all of the, all of the vendors. So, talk up now, sir. Talk up now. <laughs> all right, but use the curry principle. Um, negotiate, negotiate, and negotiate for the best price. The best product for the best price from the best vendor. All right, so that is how we start. It starts with us, basically, what Dr. Lewis is saying. We have to develop that culture of negotiation. Of course, over time, our financial, um, financial services providers will get accustomed to that and perhaps even adjust their, their, their financial products to make space for negotiation. You never know. All right, so um, while the other questions come in from YouTube, I have a question for, for Kadia. All right, so, so Kadia's presentation was on finding new money. Yeah, and there's new money to be found in the digital space. Kadia, what I want to know is since the pandemic, has there been... Has there been a significant rise in the, in the number of digital businesses, meaning individual businesses? And uh, apart from those persons that you presented on, that the, the examples that you gave, what are the ordinary Jamaican stories of people who have transitioned to digital and have made it? Okay. Is this thing on? <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping you guys are hearing me uh, clearly, and I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of the times when I'm talking about, you know, taking your talent and your skills into the digital space and being able to earn from that, you know, there's, there's this thing, people think that this is, oh, it's just some people mm -hmm. that can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not for me as the ordinary everyday person, but the beauty about the digital space is, as I said before, one of the benefits is everybody has access. Once you have access to broadband internet and a smart device, anyone can go online, whether uh, an individual like myself, who I may have a certain um, knowledge base or skill set, right? And I have developed this over time, or I have a natural talent. You find now, and what we have noticed is that um, a lot of self-promotion happens in the digital space. So no more comedians. I didn't know we had so many comedians. Um, there's a program now called 876 Roommates, which is just Jamaican comedians competing. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the prize is, but now they're competing, right? So um, you find that persons with natural talents, whether it's a talent to make you laugh or... Um, Art, we have about Nat Life, big up yourself, Natasha. <laughs> I love talking about her because N Natasha has been able to use the digital space to promote her skill as an illustrator and an animator. Mm -hmm. And now she's working with Adobe. Mm -hmm. Now she's making illustrations for Oprah magazine. Wow. This is all through her own efforts online. And Natasha okay. is not anybody who will come from nobody with name, mm -hmm. right? She now have no name behind her per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Jamaicans, we have our, our names. <laughs> yeah, she's an ordinary everyday Jamaican who yes. found um, utility in the digital space and has been able to 
push far beyond the Jamaican market. If anywhere where the look about Talawa is apt, it's the digital space. And what propels us online is the, 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 the popularity of brand Jamaica, as I said earlier. And it's, it's almost as if we in Jamaica underestimate our own popularity on the world stage. But Brand Jamaica is a huge brand online. And you find that people buy into Brand Jamaica and now what they have is um, access. They also have access to us. They have access to our content. They can know more about us. They can now invest. People in the diaspora can connect to businesses in Jamaica because they want to support what we're doing in Jamaica. So what I have seen in the digital space is, um, and again, I want to shift how we think about business and things that so you have to have, yeah, sell bread, uh, yeah, sell, you can sell yourself and yourself is the business. Mm -hmm. But you also have other small businesses coming in online and I want to tell you, competing hard, hard, hard mm -hmm. with some very well-established mm -hmm. businesses, mm -hmm. right? So you find even a Gucci online, everybody knows Gucci, mm -hmm. right? But they're online because why? Consumers come into the market every day mm -hmm. and you have to keep reintroducing yourself <laughs> to these new set of consumers, telling them why you are good at what you are and mm -hmm. why you have these established names, but then you have a boohoo, right? That can come mm -hmm. in and compete mm -hmm. in fast fashion that can come in and compete. Mm -hmm. And that is what is happening in the Jamaican space. So illustrators, artists, comedians, musicians, they no longer need an agent. Mm -hmm. All they need is a community on Instagram or TikTok, mm -hmm. providing value for that community. And that the, the, the reciprocity that happens is I pay you for that value. Okay. And that's what, that's what we've seen a lot happening since the pandemic. And a lot of chuck off happened during the pandemic. <laughs> a whole heap of people chucking off into the entrepreneurship space, <laughs> and into the digital truck. space, going, listen, yeah, man. now is the time. General more. Everybody yeah. just, you know. No people but are going they've, been profiting, <laughs> they've been profiting from it big time. And I'm really happy to see that. Mr. B.O.J., sir. One of the biggest problems yes. talk, <laughs> we talk, are having talk, as creators talk, in the digital space, talk. sir, is payment processing. Yes, talk. We're accessing new markets. Everybody loves brand Jamaica. Everybody wants a piece of it, and we can give them that. And we can benefit directly from that because for a long time, the ordinary, everyday citizen of Jamaica wasn't benefiting from brand Jamaica, even though we are brand Jamaica. Now that we can benefit the hindrance is not being able to accept payment online. So we do have banks that have a little thing that happened where nobody can afford because, you know, right? And the, own, the processes are onerous to be able to um, get onto that kind of system. So we're creating our own limitations in that way. So if there is anything that the BOJ can do to kind of push that now that you guys are going into the digital space with your currents and excitement, right? <laughs> if you could push the policy along as well, whereby it becomes as simple as a plugin, um, that we can use our WordPress website and access, being able to access payments from anywhere that comes straight to our local bank account without 30 days, you're waiting on 30 days to clear your YouTube check. Or the, the fees, the, the ridiculous fees that are associated with converting that into Jamaican does into your account. These are the things that are slowing us down. So the citizenship is there. We're there. But the processes are not yet there. And that's, that's, a, that's a big, big, big problem. One of the biggest problems we're having um, in terms of e-commerce and digital transacting. Uh, Dr. Lewis, um, to feel it. Loud and clear. Mr. Shafilid, Loud and Earth, clear. Nah lie. <laughs> Loud and clear, yeah. Earth on behalf of her constituents. <laughs> so, um, Minister Clark, um, uh, Minister Smith, Miss Morrison, Jide, <laughs> Dr. Lewis, help. <laughs> help the people in Vex out here. You hear her, sir? To say CBDC and all these things. You know, as if to say, <laughs> um, but but I'm sure, but I'm sure, and I'm I'm not only sure, I quite know that um, it requires legislative changes, and um, until those changes are made legislatively, um, then the BOJ then can, um, if can, if 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 it can if it can speed it up is what we're saying. Um, just to, as I said before, the legislation needs to match our digital ambition. All right. So to add to what um. To Arcadia's, there are other opportunities for a digital business. 
there, there is now an exponential market in coding. If you are interested in um, technology and computing, computing, learn to code. There are lots of job opportunities um, that abound, not only in Jamaica, but internationally. Um, because of the pandemic, remote work is now a thing, or perhaps the thing. And what that gives you access to all these big tech companies, then there are the fangs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Spotify, those companies, they're always recruiting um, expert coders and persons who are skilled in SEO and um, what is called the, the, the algorithms that social media uses. So learn to code, those are, those are other opportunities. Animation is also another, another opportunity stream for digital business, animation and visualization. So if you can put yourself into those um, kinds of opportunities, you will be finding new money. All right, um, I have another question. And this is from Winston, Winsome Marshall on YouTube. And this is for Sheldon. Sheldon, you're popular, <laughs> popular with the ladies. All right, Sheldon, I am currently a housewife. Am I able to open an account with a FHC? And I'm, I'm assuming she's meaning because she doesn't have a pay slip and um, perhaps the, the regular documents that are required. Can she open an account with FHC? Um, yes, of course. Yes, she can. Um, as I said before, it, it, it's that simple. Uh, and what, at ID, TRN, proof of address, two references, $3,700, and that's it. <laughs> yes, she can. All right. Absolutely. All right. So it's as simple as that. Um, thank you for that question, Winsome. And there is another question. I think this would be for Kadia. Um, how can you reiterate on ad revenues and how a small business product producer can benefit from ad revenues? Okay, so when we're talking about ad revenues, ad is really short for advertising mm -hmm. revenues. In 2019, YouTube made $15 billion in ad revenues. Mm. Uh, most of that went to their top 1% of creators mm -hmm. on the platform. So we we're talking about advertising revenues and, and this is what persons need to also understand about these social, social networks. Uh, the longer you can keep someone on their platform is the more that benefits you. Because if on Instagram and Facebook, there's a reason why it's free mm -hmm. to sign up. Mm -hmm. Because what they're selling is advertising space. They're selling eyes, right? So as a creator, who um, you're, put, you're publishing content on these pages, you're benefiting a Facebook and an Instagram because you're now drawing people to the space and they can sell those people to advertisers. But as a creator yourself, there are several ways you can get ad revenue. You can get ad revenue through the YouTube um, system where um, if you have more than 1,000 subscribers on YouTube and you have 4,000 plus viewing hours, you are now qualified to be a part of the YouTube creator platform. Okay, can, and you, as, can, you, can you just say that again? Because somebody did go, somebody did go to the kitchen, get something <laughs> to drink, and take out one piece of crackers and say, I'll come back. So they come back, it. all right, just, drink some them, water. They just hear 1,000 subscribers. Right. And, they, and say, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> they even put on a piece of crackers in a car, the more air good. So repeat that Yeah, comment. I mean, you have to have, in order to be able to participate in that revenue sharing, you have to have a minimum of a thousand subscribers on YouTube, mm -hmm. and it, it differs because there's also Twitch, which a, which a lot of Jamaicans are not tapping into, but money that they so too, right? Right, but you have to have a minimum of a thousand followers, and you have to have at least four thousand hours of watch time, meaning that through the content that you're creating, there has to be over four thousand hours of people watching that, and yes. YouTube tracks these things right. very well. And how, right? and how much are you paid? Well, it depends on the type of um, ads that are being run on your platform. Yes. And it also depends on the frequency of the ads being run on your platform. Okay. Um, there's a pay-per-click kind of thing mm -hmm. where if the ad runs and you click it, then you get a share and, you know, mm -hmm. get a share. So it, that's, that gets into the weeds a little bit. That gets a little bit complicated, mm -hmm. right? So it depends on the type of creator you are, how many ads are being run during the content that you're, you're, you're publishing as well. And it's a whole lot of uh, legalese that surrounds all of that because, as I said, YouTube is very uh, particular mm -hmm. with a lot of things, right? 
And, you know, de demonetization of your platform on YouTube is actually a thing as well. If you, like, for instance, you have a song that you're playing in there, there's a copyright infringement, etc. So it's very delicate. So that's, a in that's why that's in indirect monetization. A more direct way that you can profit from ads if, like, oh, Digital Jamaica has a podcast. Check it out. It's on Spotify, <laughs> Apple, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts, right? I, I, um, on the podcast, what we can do is, if the Jamaica Stock Exchange, hint, hint, wants to run an ad, <laughs> right, on our podcast, right, we can designate a certain amount of time them for them. them. No, hint, hint, them hint, 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 right? Them, them have money, you know, <laughs> 300 percent, you make money, money, you There know, you go, know, right? 20, 80, you know. Or, or if the... Team, so you know. There you Him go. Regular, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or if the FHC or BOJ come to us and say, hey guys, we have a new product coming out and since your audience is a tech-based audience and this is something that could benefit them, we want to partner with you and we run ads during the, the show. It's not going to sound like an ad, mind you. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. But it's an ad and they pay me for the ad. That's what Kalila does. Okay. Um, there's not really an ad that runs through her program, but she said this is sponsored by... Right, and she tells you who our sponsors are. So she's making money directly from ad revenues, but it's going to her. It's not going through YouTube. So she's making double money. YouTube ad revenues and direct sponsorship and ad revenue that comes to her as the content creator. So there are several different ways that you can, that you can do that. Um, you can get money through ads slash sponsorships. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, Katie just um, shared with us the, the various uh, streams of income available through the digital space. Quite, ex quite exciting, quite expansive. And you know, what is, you know what's so good about it? It's so easy to access. I mean, it's so easy to access, and the, and the returns are almost immediate. I hope you've been watching and listening, paying close attention, and making a deliberate plan to, um, to use this information to become wealthy. Uh, we are about to wrap up. I'm going to ask each of our presenters to say two words, literally in two words, what would they say to the, the viewing audience on financial literacy and wealth creation? Two words. Um, I'll start with you, um, Michael Johnson. My two words would be Get started and get information. All right, four words. <laughs> All right. So the words are start and information. Start and information. Melissa, two words to the viewing audience. Well, I'll give you three. All right. Cut your bad habits. <laughs> Drip up. Drip up. <laughs> <laughs> Drip up. Sheldon, two words for the viewing audience. Um, Self-discipline. Right. All right. David Geddes. Four words. Check before you invest. <laughs> All right. We can work with that. And last but not least, Jude Lewis. Four words. Painful and on time. <laughs> <laughs> on right. time is one word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. This has been the inaugural Wealth Summit presented by the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. We have been broadcasting live from the Jamaica Pegasus. So the theme of Wealth Summit is investing in Jamaicans, and we do so by ensuring or promulgating your financial literacy. This month's theme has been making every cent count. All right, so because we are appreciative of the presentations of our various presenters, you know what will happen this time, you know? We are going to get things. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going on. All right, may we ask, is that Miss Weeks telling me that um, she will make the presentations to each presenter? Miss um, Shelley and Weeks, she is the Director for Communications and Public Relations at the Ministry of Finance. She'll make some presentations to each presenter. All right, so we're starting with, uh, with Kadia. Kadia, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, if you're in the chat, can we see some fire, you know, some claps, some something? Because um, she gave us a lot of information on, on making money in the digital space.
summit. Your contribution is invaluable. I've learned some things. I know y'all have learned some things out there. And everybody in this room learned some things. Some of us have some bad habits that Melissa spoke about. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this is another thank you. <laughs> thank you as well. All right. Okay, Melissa Golden, a.k.a. Miss Drip-Up. Thank you. Uh, the man from Calabar. <laughs> Mr. Sheldon Christian. <laughs> and Mr. David Geddes, Financial so Services Commission. And Dr. Jude Lewis, uh, Bank of Jamaica. Thank you. Okay. Me get things too. Me get me get things too. I've been talking all this time and they might not honor nobody ever tell me. <laughs> oh Lord. I want to say a special thank you. If anybody don't know now, no going to know, Anna is my friend. I called Anna and I said, Anna, it has to be you. Uh, she rose to the occasion. She did an immensely <laughs> fabulous job today. Uh, and I just want to say to your face in front of people. Thank you very much and big up all of yourself. You were amazing today. Thank you very much. And you get things too. Okay. All right. I get picture too. All right. Thank, thank you to everybody for tuning in. Anna, you want to finish up your, your way I finish uh, up that with problem. your things? And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was quite a surprise. Thank you so much, Miss Weeks. It has been my immense pleasure and privilege. Now, where do I look again? Right here. This is where my audience is. Ladies and gentlemen, that has been, this has been the, the first ever Wealth Summit hosted by the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. But before we go, remember that word that I taught you. PESIB, P-E-S-S-I-B. Yeah? You've been following for, for what the letters mean. But the word PESIB is actually an acronym, so I can tell you at this point. So the, the, the PESIB are the components of financial literacy. All right, so this is the kind of information that you need to be, financial, to be considered financially literate. So how to protect your money? Melissa told us that. Stop those leaks. How to earn more? Um, David gave us some examples. Also, Michael, um, through the stock exchange. How to save your money. Um, Melissa also gave us some tips on that. And how to spend wisely. Yeah? How to invest and how to borrow. Um, Dr. Lewis would have given us some clues on that. So this is passive. If you don't remember anything from today's summit, it is passive. Protect earn, save, spend wisely, invest, and borrow responsibly. All right? That is all, that is all part of the components of financial literacy. Once you learn all those things, you are financially literate. When you are financially literate, you are empowered, and the empowerment brings wealth. This has been the Wealth Summit presented by the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. May I thank our viewers for joining us. May I thank those who joined us from the ministry themselves. I understand they joined us via Zoom. 
Thank you for tuning in for Facebook, YouTube, and social media. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the questions that allowed us to get further insights into the presentations. Thank you for tagging us, for using our hashtag. Thank you for promoting. Thank you for registering. Your interest in wealth will redound to the ultimate success of our country, which is economic growth. It starts with one person. The more you know, the more you do. And the more you do, the better for us. If you know Beris, Beris has a song, um, what one dance can do, I can tell you what one man can do. And one man can make the rest of us wealthy just by knowing what to do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been a part of the first ever Wealth Summit. We look forward to your participation in the future. Thank you. As we say goodbye from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel, it is Pessim. Be wealthy. Thank you. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs>